And we're live. Welcome. Uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are the Goslings. And we are extremely excited. We're doing this a day early. We can't wait. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, we, we've been on pins and needles like all week. It's yeah. been super cool. So. I've had IBS all day. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, we are going to be interviewing the man, the myth, the legend, the inspiration for so many writers out there, uh, Stephen Pressfield. Yep. The man himself. The yep. War of Art, A Man at Arms, Gates of Fire, the list goes yep. on. And his new book. Yeah, a man at arms. A man yeah. at arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's going to be great. So, As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to bring him on uh, right now. We're going to do our toast. Yeah. And uh, we're going to bring him on with us in uh, three, two, one. Introducing, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, the incomparable, the immortal, yep. the amiable. Yeah, the gracious. The overly gracious <laughs> Stephen Pressfield. Thanks for joining <laughs> Okay, Jonathan, Nick, it's great to be here. It's great to be with everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're absolutely. You're welcome. Well, um, you want to go ahead and do the toast? Yeah, let's do yeah, the toast. So we can jump right into it. Grab your, well, I know it's early where you are. It's noon here. And so it's our the, day off. And it's our day <laughs> off. So the sun is at almost over the yard arm. <laughs> Normally we do this a little later in the day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. yeah. So um, Starbucks will work. I'll start and yep. then everybody else go. I'll after. join you. All right. Take up the broken sword of your father. And strike down the darkness. Strike down the darkness. Cheers. Cheers, sir. Ah, that's beautiful. That's good. Ooh, what is uh what is this? That's really smooth. That's Bib and Tucker. Bib and Tucker. Yep. Yeah. Bib and Tucker. Yeah. And, uh, Tennessee. It's a Tennessee bourbon. Yeah. Whiskey. I don't know if you can call it bourbon because it's not actually. I was going to say, Kentucky. yeah, it's not from Kentucky. Yeah. So, anyways. But that's why it tastes better. <laughs> well, we have a ton of questions for Mr. Pressfield, um, but he has been gracious enough to give us a half an hour. Or so, yeah. we're going to pare it down to, you know, as few as possible. Um, you want to hit the list yeah, and let's hit the see list. what. It's kind of hard to determine where to start. Mr. P, because honestly, like it's it's a mile long. Twenty five <laughs> years of compiling well, you know, questions can, for you. We can do it again <laughs> too, you know. So, yeah, good. Okay, awesome, very good. Well, uh, let's talk about a man at arms first. Absolutely, can we? Yeah, absolutely, yeah? absolutely, awesome. So, uh, Stephen Pressfield obviously has a book that's been out for a while now, A Man at Arms. This is uh, this is a ancient history fiction and um, takes place in the first century A.D. Uh, it's about the mercenary Telamon, who is a recurring, reincarnating character in Telamon or in uh, Mr. Pressfield's ancient history work. Um, first showed up in Tides of War, correct? Was yes. that his first appearance? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I would actually like to talk about this book a little bit at some point, but we did have some questions about yeah. a man at arms. Yeah. Um, do you want to do the Hollywood question first? Yeah, let's do the Hollywood question. First. Yeah. All okay. Right. You guys Maybe are great so, together, by the way. Uh, <laughs> our brothers, man. We go. Way, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, we're we're huge movie buffs. Huge. Yeah. Reading this book, I'm like, okay, is there going to be a Man at Arms motion picture? And if so, who would you cast to play Telemon? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a great one. Um, actually, there's really, it, amazingly to me, I don't mean to sound immodest, there's been no, it, you know, nobody has approached me yet uh, from the movie business. And the, my only, my rationalization for this, and it may be true, I think, even, is that with COVID, I think that the studios and, and various people kind of started stockpiling stuff because at the start of it because they wondered you know is there yeah. going to be anything at the end of this COVID thing mm -hmm. that's what that's what i'm telling myself because i i really i think it would be a great a great movie too yeah. and uh, if i were casting it vigo mortensen or vigo mortensen would be like oh, oh that's a good pull yeah, yeah. for this yeah. guy yeah yeah that well because he's uh he's middle-aged um he's in his 40s he's in shape because yeah. he you know, as a, a Roman was, uh, remind me, was he a centurion? I know he was a legionary. We never I, found out. We just, we just sort of found out yeah, that. that he was somebody of some rank. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, maybe like an optio or I, I won't get too deep in the woods. Yeah, something that. Yeah, like sorry. That. <laughs> who would play, uh, who would play Michael? Do you actually, as a matter of fact, would you cast yourself to play Michael? Uh, no. <laughs> but I think, 
I think the rest of them, uh, you know, actually, Nick, Jonathan, I, tr I usually try not to think about that when I'm working okay. on it. Okay, really? And then okay. try to put it in mind and just let the characters be who they are okay. in the book. So okay. I don't yeah. I try not to think ahead of that. So yeah. we'll see. Maybe something will happen at some point, but it hasn't happened yet. Well, Vigo Mortensen is such a – that's such a good um, – pull for that casting choice because uh that is kind of the image that you get of someone who's you know able to survive on their own i think the fox skin cap that he wears is very apropos for his character you know because he is kind of this like this lone you know this lone wolf this lone yeah. you know uh scrounging kind of survivor this he's the ranger he's the ranger he's he is yeah. he's kind of the ranger yeah, yeah the aragorn type yeah. of character uh, we we thought Jim Caviezel would yeah. be uh, a really good. Uh, that's uh, kind of thing too. He's got a certain Jesus like quality, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. he's like, yeah, he's yeah. in the he's in the time frame. He's done movies right. yeah. in that same uh, in that you know representing that same time frame. Yeah, yeah. in a really well. So. Well, you know, Hollywood. See, we have no experience with Hollywood, but I remember yeah. talking to you via email. Um, gosh, almost twenty years ago at this point, when Gates of Fire was being optioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were in the process of um, it was a competing project with 300. Um, yeah, I don't know how much of that we can talk about, but um, but yeah, anything you know, you you've had experience with plus Legend of Bagger Vance, which was turned into yeah, certainly with the Gates of Fire. That was uh, there were like the two two screenplays moving down the track at the same time, competing with each other, 300 and the Gates of Fire, and it was just a question of who would get the casting first and who would get the green light first. Right. 301. Man. Well, they I, got it wrong. They got it wrong. You know, no kidding. <laughs> I mean, like well, 300 is for, a room for everybody. There is, you know, and 300 is a fun movie, but I remember going to that movie just as, as like a Gates of Fire super fan. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like this book, I read this when I was 17 because of Nick yeah. and, uh, and Nick read it because of, our eldest brother. Our elder brother it read it first, gave so it to it, me. I read it and gave it uh, to him. Trickled down. We should have bought three copies. My apologies. Yeah, <laughs> I think I've, yeah. <laughs> it was a hand me down. I probably bought enough down. copies since then to like compensate <laughs> for it, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but this book just, it transformed. Uh, it's like the Bible and then mere Christianity and then this book and Paradise Lost. Those are like your big influences. The, yeah. the major influences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gates of yeah. Fire is, it is the, whenever anybody asks me what my favorite novel is, because, you know, you can see, if I remember your history correctly, Mr. Pressfield, you... Um, Jonathan, you can call me Steve. You know, don't, don't worry about that. I'll call you Steve. All right. I didn't want to be presumptuous. I'll yeah. call you Steve. Um, so you, uh, you, in your attempts to dodge the draft, you wound up at Paris Island. Uh, and then you got later on, you got a degree in psychology from Duke University. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, I had the degree before Paris Island, but before uh, Paris Island. Uh, okay, okay. gotcha. Well, you can see the two major influences um, in this book. Yeah, I mean the the Jungian archetypes that are at play, uh, the the like masculine military um, feel. Plus the romantic Arthurian legend of Sparta. Gates of Fire is such a, a beautifully encapsulating yeah. work of fiction. It teaches you, it taught me that you can be uh, erudite in your diction. You can be introspective and, uh, and still be masculine at the same time. It really created a template for a lot of, I think, young aspiring male writers who, who don't have anything like that. Like, there's, I don't think there's anything else like this. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems so singular. Well, I don't know. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm glad that, uh, yeah, that's great. It's high praise. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. You should well, put that in a review. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah I've, I've left some pretty lengthy, like, you know, uh, drooling reviews <laughs> on should, Amazon in my day. We should ask them this question you know. next. Uh, was, oh, okay. So, yeah, so we'll dovetail back to, I'm sorry, I could talk about these forever. Um, so one thing about a man-at-arms uh, that really spiked our interest was uh, the Man of Bees. Um, sure. The Man of Bees sort of seems like in in um, the Virtues of War. At the end, Telamon sort of finds his new path by you know deciding to go off and study with the Swamis, with the Gurus. Mm -hmm. uh, he's fascinated by these you know these mystics, and he wants to see what the next step is, the next evolution in his journey. 
Uh, and the Man of Bees almost seems like maybe a version of that that is very colorful, very interesting. And is there a correlation choice. between the two? Like, is the Man of Bees supposed to be some sort maybe of Maybe on some unconscious level, Jonathan. I'm not sure. Now, just for people who are listening, the Man of Bees or the Man Made of Bees is a character that our people on their uh, on their journey across the Sinai wilderness, they encounter this sort of solitary guy who's sort of a gatekeeper, like a threshold guardian type of guy. Yes. And, and, and he is surrounded by bees, his entire bees all over his face, bees over every inch of his body. And, yeah. um, you know, and he passes on a few sort of cryptic pieces of wisdom. But I actually stole this from a screenplay that I wrote like 30 years ago. No kidding. Where, where the bees were, and I kind of believe in this too. I mean, when you see a hive of bees, there's something mysterious about them, right? There you, is. You really feel like they're they have a collective intelligence, you know, that's that's greater than just a queen or whatever, and that they somehow are, uh, at least in my mind, and also because bees kind of travel everywhere, you feel like they know everything that's going on, right? They're scouts, <laughs> they go out. So I wanted this, I don't really even know exactly what the man made of bees represents in this story, just that he is a, a source of wisdom and that somehow this comes from the bees, that the bees in the story, he was crucified, but survived, was taken down and by friends and survived and was nursed back to health by the bees, some yeah. one way or another. And honey, of course, is a great, you know, I don't know what you'd call it, a homeopathic or some kind of a, you yeah. know, you can apply yeah. it, it pulls poison out of the pores of the body, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So in my kind of half-assed way, I want him to be a kind of a mysterious dude that we weren't sure exactly what he what he knew and what the bees had to do with it. Yeah. that's uh, That makes perfect sense. And it's so funny how you can – you know, the writer's journey is such a marathon and not a sprint. And you can pull something from 30 years ago, yeah. you know, and dust it off and spit polish it a little mm -hmm. bit, throw some Brasso on it, you know, and <laughs> and send it out into the world and repurpose it. And it kind of demystifies writing a little bit sometimes for people when they think about like in editing for movies, you know. Uh, when you listen to like commentaries or when you listen to editors or writers talk about how they, they move things around. And it's sort of, it makes people realize like, oh, this really is like building a house more mm -hmm. than it is like orchestrating something Fantasia style from the universe, you know, <laughs> but there is a bit of that. There is a bit of that, that mysticism, that muse, you know, interpersonal relationship that goes on. And uh, the man of bees was, or the man made of bees was such a fascinating, colorful. It, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It was like a, an interesting splash of color in the story. Yeah. Very unexpected yeah. and a very colorful, colorful character. Yeah. Who has a, a very interesting role in the story. Yeah. And uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you about is I've been, I've been following on Instagram. I've been following your series <laughs> on the God bless, bless you. you. Uh, I've been following your series on the hero's journey. Ah. You're making videos about the different beats of the, the, you know, the hero's journey story structure. And uh, you were in our backyard the other day. That's right. Yeah. Were, yeah. yeah. Franklin, Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, yeah. that was really interesting. What inspired you to uh, uh, want to create a series and talk about story structure? Um. Just that, you know, just that it's so interesting, Nick. I think, you know, the uh, anybody that's writing any kind of novel, any kind of story, I mean, the concept of, of the hero's journey, the Joseph Campbell concept, you know, of the various beats of, you know, uh, the, uh, me, the, the call, the refusal of the call, the meeting with the mentor, all of those sort of things mm -hmm. are a big part of any kind of story, but they're also a big part of our lives, I think, you know, that we all have many heroes journeys and yeah. in fact almost any sort of segment of our life that means anything falling in love and getting married having kids starting a new project writing a book doing a podcast mm -hmm. is a kind of a hero's journey where you sort of go from the known to the unknown and various predictable beats come along and i don't think it's been talked about enough so i just thought let me put this out there there are a lot of people who haven't heard of it or have heard of it only a little bit and 
I've done a lot of thinking about it. I've done a lot of writing about it. So I just thought this yeah. would be a good series. Let me put it out there and see if it helps anybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, it, it does. It's awesome. As a matter of fact, uh, last night I watched every, every Friday night I do pizza movie night with my kids uh -huh. and my, my son's 12. So I'm starting to introduce him to some, you know, non animated movies uh -huh. that I enjoyed. <laughs> Some of the 90s years. movies that yeah. we grew up with. Yeah, you know? absolutely. The 90s were great. And yeah. uh, we watched Independence Day last night. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I printed off kind of a, my interpretation of the three X story structure for him. We, we're a homeschool family. So this is, we can uh -huh. do all these nerd, all this nerdy stuff. And my kid <laughs> kind of just expects uh -huh. it. Uh, and yeah. so as we're going through the movie, he's like checking off, you know, oh, this is the inciting incident. You know, oh, this is you know, Dark Knight of the Soul. Yeah, you know, going through it, it was a lot of fun, That's and cool. and he gets it. He'll he'll say he'll say, wait, Dad, is this is this the part of the story where the hero gets back up one time and delivers a <laughs> devastating blow? I'm like, yeah, this is it. Watch, we'll play it, and sure enough, yeah. So he's starting to kind of pick up on that, uh, probably a little faster than his dad does. <laughs> right? You know? Yeah, yeah. So it's been yeah. a lot. It's been it's been really it's been really Good cool for him. watching. Like, yeah. 60 years old before I figured that stuff out. <laughs> I'm, right? I'm, yeah, I'm 43 yeah. and I'm just learning this. Yeah. You know, but yeah, I'm Nick to actually get him in did. Uh, Nick went to, I think it was a year and a half ago, Nick went to like a writer's seminar where yeah. like it kind of opened his eyes to the three act structure and yeah. the, yeah. the hero's journey, like in a mechanical sort yeah. of way, you yeah. know, and then he came back. He was like, dude, I got to redo this. I got to redo this, you know. Do you, uh, when, when you write, and this is one of my questions, have you ever written a story and you kind of felt like you were pantsing it, but subconsciously it was actually following all these beats? I do, are you conscious of the beats as you're writing or is that something that flows naturally after time? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question, Nick. It's like, uh, I think the, the earlier books like Gates of Fire and Legend of Agar Vance and um, uh, even Tides of War, I wasn't really aware of that stuff at all. And I was just sort of winging it, you know, and then I kind of learned those beats a little bit more. And then in the in the sort of um, structuring of the story, you know, before I've actually started to write it where I'm just putting out, you know, act one, act two, act three. Now I do sort of ask myself those questions, you know, yeah. is there a threshold guardian? You know, is there an act two midpoint? And yeah. I, sometimes I wonder if that actually gets in a way a little bit. It's it's a. Uh, it's kind of a tough call, you know. Sometimes it's better just to just to wing it. Like if you look at the the Legend of Bagger Vance, the book, mm -hmm. it kind of violates all of the laws, yeah. and mm -hmm. yet it works in some crazy way. So I'm sort of trying now to kind of not follow those laws quite as yeah. much, and just sort of just sort of wing it. Yeah. But you know, when you wing it, it does it winds up following those those beats, you know. You get That's the story to start somewhere, so you're going to have an inciting incident, and it yeah. has to end somewhere, so you're going to have to have a climax. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of times instinct is a good way to go. Yeah. Well, it's yeah because it it's almost like you'll subconsciously do it based off of if you if you violate those principles uh, enough, you'll get to the end of of a book and you'll just feel unsatisfied. There's no catharsis. You don't feel that that tension and release that's necessary in a narrative. And, you know, you sometimes like I've had that happen where you ask yourself, why does this not work? Like I'm towards the end. Why? And then you go back and you look and you're like, oh, right, because it's been just sort of <laughs> flatline the whole time. I yeah. haven't had this. I haven't had this, you know, these story structure elements. Yeah, that's true. So, but it's so important to have men like you in the world who will quantify and articulate those things for writers so that we don't waste 10 years, you know, <laughs> like, you know, just like, like floundering, I <laughs> like all of us did, you know? Yeah. On your website, uh, it said that you, you were writing for 27, yeah, years? 27, 28 years. I mean, before the first novel got published. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you just didn't, you never gave up. Yeah. So I did, I'm sure there were points, during that time when you're like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Basically you know, the whole time. Yeah. What, what kept you like, what, what kept you going though? I mean, was it like, I'm just going to do it until it happens or I die. Was it that kind of, that kind of mindset or. Um, well, was, uh, there's like a, a couple of answers to this, Nick. It's like, um, on the one hand, I would try to do other stuff. I would try to work other jobs 
or yeah. you know, say, forget this, this is crazy, let me just be a normal person. And I would try to do that, but it wouldn't work. I would get so depressed yep. and just be so unhappy that I just couldn't couldn't do it. And then the and the other half of it was that before the first novel was published, I had like maybe a 10 year career as a screenwriter. So I was getting some success. I was working right. in the craft and I was getting paid. So right. I felt like I was getting better. So, you know, it wasn't hard to keep going at that point. I just yeah. trying to learn and, and just keep plugging ahead. Interesting. Yeah. That's, um, and that's kind of a dance with the devil in a way, because you, you're sustaining yourself, you're scratching an itch, but it's like, do you ever think that maybe the muse is back there being like, yeah, but you really need to, be. <laughs> it's not the full embodiment, right? Like you really, you really, really need to, to be diving yeah. in, you know? Definitely. I mean, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And uh, at, during the time that I was, you know, my, my original dream was to write novels. And I wrote like three of them uh, that never got published. They were just lousy, you know, put them in a drawer, forget about it, you know. And at <laughs> some point, I, I just sort of gave up. I said, I just can't do this, you know. I'm yeah. obviously not good enough to do it. And, and that yeah. at that point, I, I, I started, uh, I, I actually moved out to Los Angeles. And I did start, had a bit of a career as a screenwriter. So for that 10 year period, I'd basically given up on novels. And, and I was, it wasn't like I was waiting for the muse to come through or anything. I just had kind of given up. I said, this is the best I can do. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came this, the, you know, the legend of Bagger Vance kind of came to me as a book. Hmm. And it did work. Finally, it worked. Um, yeah. So, but it was sort of like, something was going on way beneath the surface that I was not aware of. Yeah. yeah. And a certain amount of time needed to pass before, you know, the, the, uh, the turnstile would open and let yeah. me go through. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's funny how, uh, I I've noticed a couple of times that you're talking write, about Nick's life, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cause, cause I write, I, I write uh, middle grade fiction, short little novels, novellas, you know, for kids. And uh, I would get, you know, you get into the series and there are points where I feel like I'm burnt out and I just, you know, I just don't want it. You know, I just, I just <laughs> burn out. I just get tired, you know, and then uh, I'll feel overwhelmed by all the different things that I feel like I have to do in addition to the writing it and sometimes in place of the writing, yeah. forgive me. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting when I'm in that 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 low point where I'm feeling burnt out when I I don't want to say push through I know that's kind of an overused term but it, when I just take that one last extra step just one more little step that's when something would happen like something would give yeah in a way I don't know if that put one makes foot sense. in front of the other like yeah. nothing will happen today like I know that today nothing would happen unless I sat down and wrote something or did something for the book I'm working on. If I skip it, you know, nothing happens, but it's weird. Like if I do the thing, if I write, then something else that I've been waiting for just kind of cosmically unleashes. Yeah. It like coincidentally, it coincidentally happens. Yeah. It comes in. Like I've been waiting for a thing for five months to come through. And like that one day where I decide to push through and I'm just going to pick it back up and start writing again, that thing I've been waiting all of a sudden happens. It's this yeah. weird event that I cannot explain, but it seems yeah. almost, yeah. I don't know. It's don't so, know. it is so strange. I've never been able to figure it out either. It's almost like when you want something to happen and you're sort of putting out those vibes, you know, I wish I would get the phone call from Steven Spielberg or whatever. Yeah. The very act of wanting it, in some cosmic way stops it from happening, right? Yes. It's yeah. only when you sort of forget about it completely and go back to something pure, you know, something that's coming from your heart, even though whatever that is seems like it's non-remunerative, non-everything, right? Then all of a sudden the phone rings and something happens, um, you know, in the material world. I don't know what that is, but there's some, there's some truth. I was talking to, I was doing a podcast. I forget who it was. My apologies for that. But who, it, whoever I was talking to had, uh, was in an accident and had been, had been paralyzed from the neck down. And little by little, sensation started coming back. And he said that you know, he would get it in his fingertips and then he would get it in his, 
in his wrists and he felt it coming back. And he said that if mentally he ever started to get a little cocky and sort of say, oh, I'm really, t you know, today my, my elbow, he would, he would have a, a relapse. He would fall back. Hmm. Almost like the goddess or whoever it was was saying to him, you know, your ego is getting in the way, man. You know, yeah. shut up and let me take care of this. Yeah. So I remember thinking, boy, does that ring true to me? Interesting. Yeah. Pride goeth before a fall. Yeah. 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 And it's so that in that invisible world that kind of exists along riders that's influencing some where the I'm assuming the muse resides. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, you know, our ego is our, we become our own worst enemy in that. In yeah. that realm, yeah, and working against, yeah, against our own selves, yeah. right? Well, so uh, I think it may have been uh, the Lex Friedman interview, or uh, it may have been another one. Uh, my apologies as well for not remembering. But at one point in one of your interviews, you uh, talked about how there's there's like a binary structure. There's there's love, which is actually articulated in Gates of Fire. There's love and um, and sort of uh, selflessness. And then there's the ego and fear on the other side. And um, and actually, C.S. Lewis talks a little bit about that in Mere Christianity. I was curious, uh, real quick, uh, why you thought the uh, the ego and fear are mated together. Hmm. I mean, I think what, what we're talking about, Jonathan, is, is, is sort of like, is, um, I think in this material dimension that we live in, where we have a physical body and where we can die and where we can get hurt and where things can go wrong, wrong, wrong with the body, that fear is the dominant emotion, whether we realize it or not. We may not think this, think it's true, but if you've read like The Denial of Death, you know that wonderful book, or the, the gist of, of what uh, the author says, or I'm blanking on his name here, is that everything we do as human beings, have children, try to achieve success, try to leave a mark, uh, having buy insurance policies is because we're afraid of death because that's mm -hmm. the, the moment. But yeah. in in the in the dimension above that, in the higher dimension, whether you call it heaven or Mount Olympus or whatever it is, the um, where there is no physical being, where we're pure spirit, then the dominant emotion, in my opinion, is love. Yeah. And where is on this dimension? we feel separate from every other individual, right? We always yeah. feel like, oh, I can hurt Joe, but it won't hurt me. Right. On the higher dimension, we're very aware that we're all one. Yeah. And if I hurt somebody else, the karma immediately happens to me, you know? Yeah. And so on that dimension, if we know that we're all connected, then the predominant emo emotion is love. This is my theory anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing yeah. about the Spartans, the true Spartans at Thermopylae, who, who gave their lives, they were acting according to the laws of that higher dimension. Yes. Not according to the law. So fear was replaced by love. And yeah. that, I think, is why 2,500 years later, that story is still so, carries such an emotional charge yes. because yeah. it speaks to the soul. It speaks to our own yeah. reality. Just yeah. like the story of Jesus on the cross, right? Right. Fear is replaced by love. Yeah. It's such a logos driven. Um, I mean, that is, you know, that is the message of, of God ultimately is reunion, communion, mm -hmm. overcoming because sin is so often equated with fear and the ego and selfishness. I mean, just reading the 10 commandments, it's like a list of, you know, things to red flags of fear and the ego. <laughs> yeah, but know? it's like love to the point of self-sacrifice. Of self-sacrifice. Well, and it's even with quantified finality. in or, or encapsulated in here with the wicker bracelets that uh, that you had the Spartans. Uh -huh. with, yeah, which is, and which is a true thing, by the way. Not Is it really? History. Yeah. I didn't think that. That's for real. Wow. See, this is like this is the beauty of of these books and what Mr. Pressfield does, because what Steve does is he exhaustively researches things you know, in like a, we would call it like nerd culture. Like, you know, you're, you're yeah, just yeah. totally into something and it's like, well, you can dumb it down for mass consumption, or you can just like dive deep right into <laughs> it. And it's almost like, you know, the reward is, is really in those like subterranean depths of just like being so immersed in the culture and the research, yeah. um, which really which uh, we appreciate. Well, we really do. Cause I was curious um, why did you, 
Telamon has existed since uh, what, probably uh, 400 BC, approximately. Yeah, yeah. this one, yeah. and then he goes all the way to the time of Alexander the Great. Uh, I think he's maybe the character in the profession, if I remember correctly. Yeah, just a little tiny cameo. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so up through. We wanted to know why did you choose? And forgive me if you've answered this in a previous interview. I haven't seen it. Why did you choose this time period, first century AD Jerusalem, with you know parallels to to Christianity and uh, and the early church? Uh, that's a that's a great question, Jonathan. And a lot of this is instinct too. You know, I've been trying really? to bring this character back, and uh, for a long time, I just haven't had the right story. And you know, there this is a sort of a uh, I don't know if you call it a trope, but it's something that have that other writers have done with other characters, where a character comes mm -hmm. back century after century, and he can't seem to die. Right? Yeah. We don't yeah. know what happened in between. Did he die and was reborn or whatever? But yeah. he's um, he's obviously on a journey, on a journey yeah. of self-discovery or something like that. And I, I wanted, it wasn't even in my mind in A Man at Arms at the start to make this, you know, borderline Christian or right. to go into that sort of thing. I just sort of glommed onto um, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you know, First Corinthians, yeah. book of the Bible, just as a great dramatic device, you know, a real letter that the Romans are really trying to stop from getting, you know, et cetera. But I, I wanted, Telemann is kind of a guy, to me, he's like a Western hero yep. who is like a Clint Eastwood type of gun yeah. spear. But he's a Mandalorian. Like, yeah. Like a Samurai, Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who is stuck in that warrior archetype. Yeah. So the question becomes, from a narrative point of view, how are we going get to get him out of it? What's the next phase? And it has to be something of the spirit. He has to somehow move from his weapons to his heart, one way or another. Hmm. So that's sort of, you know, again, this is sort of all instinct that just sort of brought me to that period post crucifixion when things of the spirit were everywhere. You know, it, uh, it, it yeah. was a force that the Romans were afraid of, yeah, and terrified of but yeah. that the rest of the world was sort of coming awake to. Yeah. And not just in the Christian sense, but there were all kinds of, you know, apocalyptic kind of messianic movements at that time. There were, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we resonate with it so much, you know, being Christians and growing mm -hmm. up in a, you know, conservative Christian household and having that lineage. It was, it was fascinating to see something from, you know, an author who primarily deals in ancient Hellenic, you know, mm -hmm. um, mysticism, paganism, and then to see you jump into like our backyard, you know, like <laughs> you know, religiously, we were yeah. like, man, this is this is really cool. Like, why is why is he choosing this one? But yeah. it is, it is such a a politically and spiritually charged time that it's just it's just like a nuclear bomb of spirituality seemed to have gone off in that area and. And it did. It terrified the Roman Empire. What's the one thing that could bring down the Roman Empire? Yeah, aside from the Visigoths. <laughs> <laughs> well, aside from themselves. As, and time. aside from themselves, yeah. right. So well, yeah. I, I know we're I know we're kind of uh, cutting in on your time. Yeah, we're yeah. cutting in on your time. But I do have one last question. I see what looks like a royal standard typewriter over your shoulder uh, yeah, you got and we are mad we're lovers. Big, yeah we're big typewriter we're fans big uh, typewriter yeah. fans yeah. uh do you hey, still do use that to, what do i have to do to get a t-shirt from you guys or even two t-shirts say the word baby email not a me your thing. size email me your yes. size and i'll mail it for to me you. medium for diana my pleasure you got it absolutely hey, got it. our pleasure yeah. um so uh we wanted to know you probably wrote on a typewriter in your early days did you uh, have you ever considered doing a whole work of fiction on a typewriter again, or are you like I'm done with that? I paid my dues. <laughs> I'm done with that. I, I paid my dues. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what we thought. Yeah, <laughs> I certainly do remember the days where you know you would edit by with a pair of scissors, cutting out a paragraph, you know, and taking it from one page and then scotch taping it into another page yeah. and all that sort of thing. So, but yeah. this is an old, uh, where it is. It looks, it's, uh, uh, I used to work at an ad agency in New York and this was my typewriter. 
And at one point, the agency kind of moved on to something, and they gave everybody a chance to buy their typewriters if they oh, wanted. Right. So, oh, you got to. so yeah. I bought it. That's a gem. That's like a cop retiring and being offered to buy his Glock 22. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, of course. Yeah, you know how many lives I've saved with this yeah. thing? Like, come on. You know? That's a, did you write uh, Legend of Bagger Vance on a typewriter? Uh, no, I wrote it on one of those early, you know, the early computers that were gigantic and had, uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> printer, you know, with the little holes in it, the perforated holes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. By the way, you guys, uh, since I know that uh, we could probably, we could keep talking forever. We could. I know. Please I'm sorry. Have me back some other time. You know, we'll do this again. Yeah. Absolutely. Man, we'd love that. Absolutely. We, we are so, listen, we're so like blown away. It's actually like kind of hard to, we, we're trying not to do the Wayne's world thing where you're like, we're not, <laughs> but it's like, it's hard, man. It's a it is hard. hard. This is 25 years of just questions and yeah. reading your work, like all kind of compressed. And I don't know what to like, what, to, <laughs> I, don't I know, know it's like, what do you ask? ask. You know, you get one, <laughs> cool. you get one shot at, you know, yeah. at the moon. What do you think? Well, well so we'll, we'll we say would. more questions for next time. Then. We would love to have you back because I would like to, I would like to talk more about that time, about the ad, uh, the ad writing life that you had lived. And, uh, cause I think you had mentioned that in some of your writing books, um, uh, the war of art, nobody wants to read your shit. Um, you know, they're uh, turning pro I'm turning pro uh, yeah. man. There's just so many. It's just, you've got such an extensive catalog of, of books i would love to, of course i didn't get to tides of war i love tides of war because it's like the empire strikes back of your of your <laughs> history it's darker it's psychological but it's beautiful and every time telemon shows up in every one of the books you're just you're zeroed in on him there's no way to miss him at all so it's so great to have a book like a man at arms that finally really talks about this character telemon yeah. and uh, i was just we could do this forever i could talk about like what is it about Telemon? Why is that? Are you Telemon? Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. He's asked me these questions. We've talked. He's like, do you think uh, that Stephen Preston <laughs> is Telemon or is it an art? Just well, an you've answered him a couple times, yeah. like in the virtues of war, you know, like Telemon. I remember an email exchange we had where you said that Telemon was kind of like what you would be saying to Alexander if you were there. And I just, I always thought about it. It's genius. It's just genius. Yeah. So uh, we love, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Thank you for doing this. And uh, if you, if, if folks are watching this and they haven't read, if they live under a rock, <laughs> right, and yeah. they haven't read any of your books, which book would you recommend they start with? Yeah, would you prefer Man at Arms. Would you say that's a good place um, to start? Yeah, yeah, I think actually it would be either Gates of Fire or a Man at Arms. Okay, okay. Yeah. I think as as a sort of a, a way into whatever I, whatever it is I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, and you so can find them anywhere. Yeah. Well, you can find them anywhere. Would you prefer them to go to your website or where can they, no, where can you they know, find whatever. your work? Amazon, any, anywhere they can get it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Very good. Um, yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Pressfield. This is, or Steve, I'm sorry. Hey. I'll figure it out. I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Southern, <laughs> man. You know. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Nick and Jonathan, thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, I really wanted to meet you guys and see you in person, you know, or at least, you know, thank your faces. You so much. So yeah. this is great. Um, like I say, anytime, have me back. I would absolutely yeah, love well, to. He and says hi too. In fact, I'm gonna bring her. Hi, right Diana. Up. Hi, Diana. We get to see Diana. Hey, hi, hey, Diana. It's so good to see hey. you. Oh, Man, uh, thank you. Hi, it's so good to see you. Yeah, you too. Thank, thank you. you so much for taking care of us. Yeah. You guys oh, are gosh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I hope it all went well. Oh, this has been this it's has been, been like a dream come true. Yeah, yeah. like I'm. Yeah. I'm probably gonna go, you know, pass out and like. No, anyways, no. We thank you guys. You guys are amazing. Um, yeah, a man at arms, you can find it anywhere for anybody who's watching if you haven't, you know, and then all of his nonfiction books are great as well. The war of art is probably a good primer to start yeah, with. Yeah. Um, and for, yeah. if you're, if you're a writer, yeah, if you're a writer, if you're a writer. Yeah. or if you're just looking to like get out from under resistance, yeah. maybe, or just you know? get better at whatever you, whatever yeah. it is you do, but so, especially if you're a writer, especially if you're a writer. Yeah. All right, Steve, thank Steve, you, bud. Thank you, sir. All right, Dick, Jonathan, thank you, thank you so much. We'll do it again. Yeah, Sounds look great. forward to it. Take care. Enjoy the rest okay. of your weekend. All right. Bye. Bye. Oh. Man. <laughs> you know what? He is so awesome. All of my social media is done. <laughs> I like, this is like, this is what a secret. This is what I've been aiming for with all my social media. I'll, I'll be so honest. I'm done. I'm over. I don't care anymore. I'll There's no honest. one else I want to interview. You know? You know my Eva May was like, 
so you're doing your live stream today and not tomorrow? And I said, yeah. Uh -huh. and, well, who, who are you? I said, is it just you guys? I said, no, we're doing an interview. And she, my nine-year-old. Yeah. Is that Stephen Pressfield? I'm like, yes, that's Yes, Stephen it is. is. Yeah. And she's like, who is? Because they're going to swim and they're like, you know, why can't you come with us? And I oh, said, well, right. this is an important, you know, this is an important interview. Yeah. She goes, and I said, look, it's kind of like, do you know who JK Rowling is? She said, no. I said, well, she wrote Harry Potter. Oh, I said, and I'm not interviewing her. <laughs> but it right. feels the same. Yeah. To me. There's, because that yeah. was my it's that was Harry my Potter. Harry Potter back yeah. then. You know, I mean it was a big deal. Big yeah. Deal. Yeah. Man, that's killer. Yeah. Dude, I mean we could we could do this for for probably at least two hours. Honestly. When you yeah. think about what all you know <laughs> we have we had, we got like four of our 28 questions. Yeah, we did. We had like nearly yeah. 30 questions because yeah. it's just like, you know, it's like, what do you, what do you articulate? What do you ask? You know, you only have a couple chances to, you know. He signed this, by the way. Yeah, that's pretty he cool. Signed us. Oh, yeah. and by the way, all these, all these men at arm books that we have here are signed by Steve yeah. Pressfield. So yep, all signed you want one, let me know. Yeah. yeah and, we, um, and he is so getting a t-shirt. Oh, dude, I'm so excited. Well, because like I wanted to for a while now, I've wanted to send him copies of all of my books, you know, with a letter that's like, look, I don't expect you to read these because it's like you don't like do that to yeah. your you don't send your stuff no. to another author and ask them to read it, you know, for whatever. Like it's kind of gauche to do that. But Pressfield has always like Pressfield is the driving inspiration oh, yeah. for like if i had to thank one human yeah for my published works it's stephen press yeah, huge influence so you huge, do you want to send all, we all of have our influences we all have our everybody's got yeah he's he's kind of the jordan peterson of the writing world yeah. you know yeah, and yeah. you really do so now i get to send him the books and it's funny so, i was talking to i was talking to our friend jim yesterday yeah. oh sweet and uh and i said you know we're <clears throat> we get to interview stephen pressfield it's so cool he's like stephen pressfield yeah i think i've heard that name i said oh yeah legend bagger fans great to fire he's like oh wow yeah. that's amazing he and, and i said yeah it's a big deal i said let me put it like this way jim because he's a huge alabama football fan yeah and i said bear bryant is the stephen pressfield of alabama coaches <laughs> okay right. let's put it like that yeah He's yeah. Like, oh, it is a oh, big deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. he got it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and he already knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jim's like, yeah, he knows his he knows his stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jim is but, uh, it, man. He gets it. But yeah, it it, it it is a big deal. He's you know, Stephen Pressfield. It this sounds so corny, but it's kind of true that he's kind of an author's author in that. Oh, he absolutely. He is, is a major major voice in how to write, how to overcome resistance, how to do the work. I mean, those are his themes. Yeah. And it, have you? been to his website lately it is amazing yeah it is amazing he does his writers wednesdays he's got this blog yeah he's and he so talks regimented. about his journey oh it's and it's and it's a beautiful website too it's yeah really good yeah the design of of um stephen pressfield's website is extraordinary and he is so industrious uh i remember it i'm was gonna take the, this uh, off i'm gonna take my headphones are we off. headphones for you? yeah since we're super nice nice. i don't get super my mickey mouse me. ears nope all right <laughs> You guys want a book? Huh? Um, oh, Nate. Nate said he'll get one of these uh, Amanda Arms books. Awesome. Oh, Thank yeah, you, dude. Uh, they're awesome. Yeah, you got to yeah, you gotta read it. It's yeah, we'll, um, we'll uh, Thanks connect. For here, yeah, way. we'll connect after the live stream. Yeah. And get you um, what was it? Uh, I don't even remember what I was saying. That's right. Whatever. That's yeah, it was super cool. <laughs> yeah, super cool. Great influence. <laughs> really? Writer's writer. He's an author's yeah. author. Yeah. What, um, it just. Is that Jared Luce? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hey you know well the interesting thing about the the man covered in bees too uh nick and i were talking about it before but we didn't get a chance to mention it on the live stream because we wouldn't want to belabor the point but uh honey doesn't go bad so like there yeah. is this you know he like he pulled it out of here's how the muse works here's how like paracletos works here's how like <laughs> inspiration and creativity works you will you will extract something that you thought was dead material, right? Like in his case, the man covered in bees 30 years ago, he created that. It's amazing. And he was like, dude, you know, that in that whole project was just DOA, right? Or yeah. dead in the water, whatever is driftwood. And he pulls it out and, you know, he extracts this one thing from it and plops it down in here. But the way 
creativity works and I think the way, you know, logos works is that is more pregnant with meaning maybe in the context of this or even by itself than you the author even are aware of. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it, it was there. maybe it was maybe it was supposed to be held in that voice. Right, and that's the thing. Until its meaning could be fully appreciated and expressed right. at this point in his career. I don't know. That's don't know. the it's thing really about creativity. That's the thing about writing and especially writing novels that like you have to you have to get over that hump of like this is not going to be a wham bam thank you ma'am kind of deal. This is this is like a long road that you're going to be on and you might have something that will just you poured your heart and soul into and now it's going to collect dust for 20 years but the timing isn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, the timing of the universe, the timing of life or for you or for what God has planned for it, it's not right and you you know, you might have to dust it off 20 30 years later. I remember uh, when I was when I was emailing him in 2004, 2005, uh, when I was writing Empyrean Falling, like like really, really writing Empyrean mm -hmm. Falling, um, <clears throat> towards the end, he told me about how Gates of Fire, there were 300 pages that had been edited out, mm. you know? And this was like the mass market, <laughs> which was like 500 pages yeah, long. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, dude, that's wow. almost like 50% of the of the book you yeah. know like that's a lot it's huge yeah and i remember thinking about that and asking him being like you know hey can i like i'd love to read that. i still would love to read it i don't care i'd love <laughs> to read like the 800 page version yeah. of gates of fire you know that his that his editor uh excise but when i finished my first draft of empyrean falling it was super bloated and inarticulate and i remember telling myself the ego telling yourself in fear and exhaustion I'm done. This is it. It's ready to go. Yeah, yeah. But in the back of your mind, you know that, like, yeah. But there's like, you know, that 300 mm -hmm. pages mm -hmm. thing is gonna. You're gonna have to cut that down. You're not done. Yeah. I remember a voice in my head saying, it "Sounded like my dad. Like, you're not done. You're not." Done. <laughs> yeah. So crazy. That's crazy, Anyways. man. Well, uh, let's. Uh, I mean, we're. That was a fantastic interview. We had about 35, 40 minutes, and now we're. Yeah. Kind of back on the rails of our normal segments. You want yep. to do Week in Review? Yeah, let's, let's do Week, do week in review. review. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, wait. Before we do Week in Review, yeah. subscribe to the Heavenly Realms YouTube channel or join the Facebook group, the Goslings Facebook group page. It's our writer's group. Just go to Facebook and search the Goslings. Yeah. Right, there we go. Yeah. Uh, it'd be really cool if I was actually like mentioning a, a sponsor right there. <laughs> but that's okay. We'll get there. All right. Yeah. We'll get there at some point. Um, all right, week in review. What's been going on this past week? I think it's obvious we've been getting ready for this. Interview. Yeah, yeah. I've been listening to. Uh, I've been watching a lot of. I'm uh, terrified to go back and watch it and oh, listen I to because I'm like, yeah. no, I, yeah, I get you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <You're> like, <gasps> well, yeah. I mean, it's not. Yeah. I'm so dumb. Why didn't I ask this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's I like, it. did I yeah. make a fool of myself? Did That's I talk the only too much? Fear. Yeah, you know, you know, because he's he's amazing. We've seen him in interview. We've heard him in podcasts. We've seen him in interviews. Yeah, he was going to be great. But uh, I've also seen me in interviews and podcasts, <laughs> right. and that was my concern. <laughs> <in> my... <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but watching those interviews, watching him be interviewed by other people has been really good because it's given you uh, sort of a feel for how, you know, how the other person interacts mm -hmm. and also not to double up on questions, mm -hmm. not to, you know, to be careful about like, you know, that was one thing actually that Nick and I kind of had a hard time with because there were some interviews who asked the questions that we wanted to ask, Yeah, you know? And so you kind of had to scramble to kind of come up with, okay, well, not, not scramble necessarily because we had a laundry list of questions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we really did have close to like 30 questions. The one question I didn't get to ask that I was really hoping like, cause I know he lives in, he lives in California and I was going to say, are you planning on moving here like everyone else from California? <laughs> right. Yeah. I think. Uh, and if so, can we be brothers? <laughs> right. Yeah. Will you adopt me? You're right. You know, you yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, are you my dad? It's it's weird. This 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 mass exodus from California. Uh, tell me about yeah. it. Well, he's not a native Californian though. Uh, he moved out there for the industry, if I remember yep. correctly. Yeah. And um, uh, Pressfield's story is very interesting. I think it's. Uh, it's turning pro. Is that mm -hmm. the one where he talks mm -hmm. about his sort of Jack Karokian? Yeah. Well, uh, it's on his website too. He talks about, you know, people will email him or ask like, if I want to be in fashion design or if I want to be in movies, do, should I have, why do I, ha should I have to move to New York, yeah. Manhattan? Should I have to move to LA? And he said, 
Yes. Yeah. You should go there. He said, put your, in his, in his words, put your ass where your heart is. <laughs> That's so you awesome. Know, put your, in that. You that, know what? That should be a t-shirt too. You know, <laughs> you I, know? we could put that yeah. over a Gosling's typewriter. And that would be so cool. Your ass where your heart is. Uh, <sighs> but it's, it's a Come great, Steven, you, Steve. yeah, it's a great uh, press field <laughs> quote. And it's like, you know, if you, if your heart is, if you're a writer, Put your ass in the chair and write. Yeah. Put sit yeah. in front of the keyboard. Uh, but also, if you're trying to get into a particular industry, yeah, you know, put yourself in a position to, you know, take advantage of yeah the opportunities the muse is going to throw your way. Well, because you need that because Nebraska ain't going to cut it. They're not no. coming to you. No, they're not. They're not. And you know, you need the community and you need the connections. Mm -hmm. That's arguably the one thing that a liberal arts degree can gain for you. You know, is that's an environment where you're going to make connections. You know, uh, it's probably like the only time you'll ever hear me say like, yeah, yeah, you know, and it's the only reason that, why you should go to college. And it's the only, only reason you would I be a part of a fraternity. Try. Yes. It's for that very reason. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I still just, for just don't get any STDs and yeah, you know, still, you know, still keep your grade point average. Yeah. Don't join the skull and bones. Right. You know, and you know, <laughs> I think there needs to be a fraternity for, Homeschool kids that go to college, mm. you know, yeah. Even if it has to exist off campus, <laughs> yeah, right. do that. When maybe when yeah. Christian even may get the college age, maybe I'll set that up for them. That'd be a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, I lost. And it. all the funny things you could call it. Oh man, it'd be good. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of material there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, the, you call it, you know, the the jean skirt club or something. <laughs> yeah. The Quaker club. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come up with something. <laughs> we'll come up yeah. with something. Try, yeah, for sure. Yeah. We'll so, what have you been doing this week? What's been going on? Uh, wrapping up, um, Adam Burl, uh, our illustrious uh, and in, and industrious narrator, yeah, has sure. uh, wrapped up um, everything for Wayfarers for the audiobook. So he and I have been. Uh, I've been listening to the rest of that. And then, um, oh man, Tiki Jim, what's Tiki up? Tiki Jim is dude? here. Late, to, fashionably late, baby. You missed you missed the Steve interview, but we're still right. happy to have you. Oh, man. you'll see it on the replay. Yeah, yeah, you'll catch it on the replay. It was great. Um, yeah, everything everything you could want. It was awesome. Um, so Adam and I are now in the process of trying to find uh, the sample, mm. which for Wayfarers yeah. has been super tough. Yeah, because there are at least two or three chapters where, like, the first or the last five minutes are just perfect material for yeah. that and uh it's really hard but you know what adam has this is one thing i would like to, i would like to have stephen pressfield on again uh obviously but one of the things i would really like to ask him one of the real questions not just like one of the fun questions like cats or dogs um <laughs> you know is uh that was one of star my questions trek by or the star way. wars yeah star trek or star wars yeah. pepsi or coke you know <laughs> you remember that time it was awesome so um, mr pressfield <laughs> Are you more of a uh, Nintendo guy? Or are you more Sega Genesis? Yes, What's up? Sega Genesis. <laughs> um, but anyway, Wayfair is trying to find a good sa audio sample chapter. Yeah, and Adam has become a great narrator. He's uh, he's really um, I got or his uh, he's become a great editor along with being a great narrator. Yep. Uh, he did a, he did a quick run through of Wayfarers and found some real like you know, some real dog piles in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that kept me from stepping into, that's why I haven't done any like real promotion for Wayfarers or any ad campaigns yet. Uh, so he got that finished. I implemented the edits, uh, re-uploaded the manuscript. I actually should have a copy. It's probably sitting in the mailbox right now. Actually. I think right. they mailed it to me a little early. Cool. So it's just the next step is, you know, that Adam is shaping up to be a pretty good narrator. Nate's a really good narrator as well. Uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. What he did on, um, uh, on the Heavenly Realms special edition, he actually edited this, um, and he did a he did a really good job. Nate, you know the thing is, like with an editor, I want it because I want to ask Pressfield about this because he has a really good editor. In fact, uh, it's either Gates of Fire or Bagger Vance, one of the two, happened because of his editor. Like it, I think he had an editor who um, who basically like believed in him. And you really have to have somebody in your corner who you can't have a mercenary. We've both done the mercenary editor route, mm -hmm. you know, and to be honest, that only gets you so far. What you really want is someone who is a fan 
who gets your material, mm -hmm. who you have a simpatico relationship with, mm -hmm. you need a cohort. You need a you need in in the tropes world. Um, you can look it up on TV tropes or just Google it. There's a great video about it. The character archetype of an editor is a lancer. A lancer mm. is like a Han Solo type. He's not the hero, but he's the he's a Jonathan to King David. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a um, you know a whatever. He's like a, um, a wingman, a wedge Antilles to Luke Skywalker. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. he is. He's mm -hmm. literally like your wingman. He's your guy who will who will fight to the death for you. He's your Harry Connick Jr. to your Will Smith. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I like the one knee approach. You know? <laughs> but you put the booty right. In where you the put the booty are. square where the lips are. You know, uh, awesome in that movie. Um, but yeah, you need you need a lancer. You need someone who because a lancer will occasionally challenge the hero. You know, a lancer will occasionally check the hero. You know, so that his ego doesn't run wild. And uh, and that's really hard to find. You can find people who are good editors, but they're they're not plugged into the material. Mm -hmm. You know, you can find people who are your friends. I, and that happened to me the last book that I published. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. it happened to me too, you know, and it got burned. Yeah. And, embarrassingly. Well, and I've been through a, a bunch of... And it was of, a book that I was selling to raise money for charity. Yeah. You know, I'm like... Great. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. But... Um, Adam and Nate both have done really good jobs of, of finding that. And it took me, I mean, uh, there were three other editors before them. You know, it's a process. An editor is your best friend, mm -hmm. as a, especially as a self-published author. Um, and, and it's so hard to find. It's just like a real best friend in real life. Yeah, it's like hard it's to find. Yeah. hard to find. For real. But it's invaluable. And if you're going to be a self-published author, you need somebody like that in your corner who can be like, yeah, I think, you know, I think what you're doing here is really good. You can do it if you want, but I think it should be like this mm -hmm. because of right. what you said 600 pages ago in this other book. Right, right. So anyway, A good friend's not afraid to point out your blind spots. Yeah, yeah. yeah you don't want a sick writing. event. Yeah, exactly. You don't want a sick event and you don't want a mercenary. Yeah. You know, because neither one of them have the have the heart to, you know, get yeah. in, in the group. So yeah. anyways, Very what cool. about you, man? What have you been up to? I uh, wrote a little more uh, Easel Bancroft and – uploaded a couple more readings of it and uh getting ready for the Pressfield interview and that's about it it's about all i've had time for yeah you've been going week. hard on the oh, Bancroft. I, I have yeah it's been it's i like the character <laughs> i like the character a lot he's really really it's mean, cathartic really snarky it's us, you know sarcastic uh -huh. yeah uh, and he's getting put in his place it's great yeah which uh, is more fun like indulging that inner the that, part of my like the version of my youth that I'm, him. you know, looking back to being like a teenager, a middle school teenager, and just like if I were to meet that kid now, I'd ugh, mm -hmm. you are just I just I can't will stand slap you until your eyes bleed. So I get to slap myself around in the book, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. Uh huh. So it's it's gratifying. It's gratifying and humbling at the same time. More gratifying than humbling. Yeah. Uh, but it's going well. That and uh, what else? I listened to a little more of Adam's narration. I'm oh, about cool. two thirds of the way through uh, the book that he's doing. And uh, yeah. same thing, looking for a sample, but I'm going to finish a lot of the actions at the end of the book. So I might take a sample from the end of the book. I don't know yet. Before. Yeah. I'm not choosing a sample yet. I want to listen. It's to hard, more. man. Choosing a sample is tough because you want to find something that encapsulates the narrative, but you don't want to give any spoilers, mm -hmm. you know? And man, I mean, yeah, I good luck, dude. Uh, Nate says, uh, as a writer, you should be either friends, friends or, or enemies. enemies with everyone you work with. Yeah, I mean, you want to have some sort like of that. personal. It's true. If you're going to have somebody in your circle on your team, it is. It's good to have uh, some sort of emotional connective investment. Uh, second time that happened. Oh. Yeah, at least I heard it this <laughs> time. Right. You know, um, Frenemies. Yeah, well, you just need some sort of some sort of connection to the person. I think that's how you get like not doing that is how you get bad covers. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. one thing I'd yeah. love yeah. to ask Stephen Presbo because this cover is pretty good, you know? Um, but like, this is actually, this is really good to be honest with you. The, that's the original cover, right? No, no, no. This is uh, the trade paperback cover. I think the original, the original hard cover was pretty good. It was very accurate. Well, it is artistically accurate. But then there was like this, this like mass market paperback cover, which may have been an iteration of this, but it just it didn't look anything like what is actually in the material. This is an amazing cover. That cover is killer. That's an amazing. A man cover. at arms. 
that looks like what you're reading. Yeah, it does. And the problem with so many covers is that like it just doesn't it doesn't represent what's actually in the material because there's no person who read the book, no cover artist read the book and was like, oh, I'll pick, I'll extract this to do it. It's been focus tested, focus grouped yep. into oblivion yeah. and market researched, you know, and, and then templated together by some mercenary cover artist designer. We've experienced this, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of dollars I've wasted on crap covers by just hiring mercenaries. Yeah. You know, strangely enough though, my blart they're legit violates company. that principle in yeah. a in a beautiful way my blart's a great company my blart is awesome m i b l a r t if you don't have a cover artist who can paint something for you if you don't have a custom you know person out there who can design some my blart is awesome they yeah. did wayfarers and wayfarers they don't argue with you they do what you want and um and they Sorry. you know let me let me let me uh, my blart yeah, Mible art. Yeah, Mible art. Yep. Mible art. Yep. Yeah. I'll so, anyways, they're they're great. But you know what? The custom cover that we had for Empyrean Fallen was really good. I mean, this. Uh, you know, it's not. It's not like it's more metaphorical in what it represents, and it kind of harkens to the original cover. Um, but it's cool. It, it looks like nothing else. It's it's unlike any of my other covers. You know, and that was a custom thing that somebody did so yeah i mean you know nate makes a good point that like you want to i think the general theme is that to have some sort of connection mm -hmm. with the people you work with because mm -hmm. it, it's like an a team man you mm -hmm. know you gotta for have sure. an a team for sure so well uh, i haven't done anything else this week other than that intro that i did oh dude the, the intro is so yeah. good can we play it um i can try i shared it with jim he knows what it is we can try yeah. it because we're thinking about adding a podcast taking yes. this live stream and also make it converting it into a podcast yeah as well um i'll try to find it uh actually let me see if i can find it right now let me see. we'll do it we'll see if we can play it for you guys um is this still on okay good uh let's see here so right jim pal says intro is killer i Dude. really appreciate that actually it really is nick worked really hard on that well it sounds like he worked hard on it he maybe didn't i don't know <laughs> But Maybe it's really not. good, you know. Maybe not. I actually kind of hope he didn't work really hard on it because it is so good that like he could just breeze through stuff like that, you know. I'm trying to find. Uh, well, I got this. Let's just do this. I'm gonna try to play this. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not. Here we go. Your local writers group is crap stop burning off your free time phones. in the presence of introverted do-nothings the goslings writers group podcast a digital gang for writers writers who actually write stuff use typewriters Boy, I hope write can all the right people now. who've offended them into their stories then murder the shit out of them Writers who don't believe in dust jackets and name their pit bulls Hemingway. We're writers who lube their typewriters with gun oil because we're straight shooters. We don't always act pretentious, but when we do, we wear f***ing ascots. Welcome to the Goslings. There you go. There you have it. Ding. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's so killer. How long did it take you to make that? Uh, I threw it together early one morning before work, so maybe maybe a couple hours at the most. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's time it well spent because yeah. it's really good. You're probably going to be hearing that at the beginning of our live stream. Yeah, that so fun to make. right before we brought Stephen Pressfield on, Nick and I were uh, gaming whether or not we could like actually start with that intro. I think we could we could probably do it in the future, right? We could just play that. As the intro, and then yeah. switch over yeah, so to yeah, yeah. We didn't want to try it this time because we were like, we don't want to like screw anything up. Yeah, no, I was, yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> experimenting. <laughs> yeah, this two is not the, before you talk to Stephen. Prince yeah, this is not the episode to experiment stuff yeah. on. You know, yeah. yeah. Jim likes the typewriter sounds, the little, the little extra sound effects and things. I appreciate that. Every time, every time a bell rings, a demon's laptop <laughs> dies. <laughs> Actually, here we yeah. It was so great, man. I, if you guys saw it when we were interviewing Pressfield, he asked him where could he get one of these shirts. Oh, dude, I cannot I wait like, to send him a shirt. 
I know you, you can find them in your mailbox. That's where they're going to be. That's where <laughs> they you're... did give me, I had asked a while back um, about sending him copies of, um, of my heavenly realms, books. just, just as a, like, thank you. Here's what your work has, you know, I, you. this wouldn't, yeah. Like this wouldn't exist without your tutelage over the decades at this point. Yeah. And uh, so they had provided me with a PO box and cool. um, yeah, Perfect. Diana was very gracious. Dude, Diana's like, she's his girlfriend. She's his, his Lancer, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. dude, they are a dynamic duo. They are a killer team. I would love, honestly, I would really love to sit down and talk to Diana and Steven at the same time. How yeah. cool would that be? Well, she to... could give some cool behind the scenes of just, the writing life, the publishing industry. I bet she could give you some yeah. insights that, yeah, that'd be really cool. Well, she does all of it. Yeah. She like, does his marketing. All of his marketing. Yeah. And she's uh, she's every bit as industrious. It's no wonder. Because when you're self-published, it's all on you. You got to do it's everything. It's all on you. Yeah. And she, like, I thought they had hired an ad agency mm -hmm. to do a lot of the stuff that I was seeing on Instagram, but it's all her. Mm. I, it's that's yeah. impressive. And she does man. a fantastic job. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. really killer, man. Yeah. So, yeah. anyways, it's been really good. We well, want to do a typewriter one-offs. Do it, baby. All right, let's do it. I got mine around here somewhere. Do you? I am determined to keep Tides of War yeah, up here. All right, here we go. You got it. We're good. I don't care what anybody says. Tides <laughs> of War is an amazing book. <laughs> I could. I really wanted it. No one like really ever talks about Tides of War a whole lot. See. Uh, no one ever really talks about Tides of War a whole lot. It's it's like the unsung you can use this one too if you want to use hero. It. Yeah, it might. It's like the unsung hero of the Stephen Pressfield books, but I love it personally in like a weird sort of way. Like it's it's all about the Peloponnesian War, and it's the exact opposite of Gates of Fire. Like no one's having a good time. Yeah, you know, but <laughs> no one's having a good no time. No one's having a good time. You know, it's, but every day is Monday <laughs> for twenty seven years. It's just nothing but Mondays. It's hot. You know? It's August in Greece. Yeah, dude. And it's Monday every day. Yeah. 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 There's this invasion of Sicily that goes wrong, and the main character and his brother get thrown into like a POW camp. So, like, you won't talk about every day being a hot Monday. Every, when hot I think, mess Monday. When I think of hashtag. Sicily, I think of a desert island where it's always three o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of summer. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? That sounds about right. You know, yeah. It's like I can't envision Sicily in any other way. Yeah. Uh -huh. That sounds about right. Uh, all right. Let's, let's do it. One off. Let's see who goes first. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. There we go. We'll figure uh, it out. Wow, three rounds that I time. know. Man, right? that, and I was hurting my hand. I Jeez. was really wanting it, wanting uh, the victory. I got a little cut right there from a uh, rusty nail. So, uh, yeah, that thing. It's a bleeder. So it's a bleeder. Uh, okay, here we go. You will never be more free than the moment you stop running and start writing. A writer is born into bondage, chained to the guilt and tug of their passions, their vices, their temptations, and their demons. The writer is a slave to powerful forces. But all is not lost. The muse, the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, Salvation awaits. The writer threatens to be drawn and quartered on the plains of Ilium by the sturm and drang of life's foul tempests. A vice will find the writer. Addiction will threaten to founder the writer's vessel on the dangerous shoals of self-destructive gratification. But out of all the most pernicious forms resistance can take, none will assassinate the writer more profoundly than procrastination. You will have time to do that book later, the serpent hisses as it slithers and coils about the writer's feet. Vanity may be conquered, vice may be slain, but procrastination endures. Irony is the spice of life, but the writer must recognize that no one is promised tomorrow. There is Logos in Carpe Diem. The enemy will defeat you with false promises. The writer knows they must not be deceived. The serpent must be crushed. The dragon must be slain. Straining against your chains will avail you nothing. Turn, fight. Liberation is in the warfare. You will never be more free than the moment you stop running and start writing. 
nice. Very good. Liberation is in the warfare. Yeah. That's a good line. Do you come up with that? Yeah. Is that just free? Wow. Dang, dude. That's awesome. That line, thank you. That line that uh that the first sentence, the first and last sentence hit me. I was laying in bed Thursday night, midnight, and like out of nowhere, the line just wow. <laughs> like I literally was laying face down on the pillow and just like wow. out of nowhere. Yeah. So you got lanced. I did. I got lanced. Yeah. Was lanced, yeah. I got wow. lanced by the muse. She came down like the Archangel Michael and put her foot on my <laughs> head. Just took that thing, with, you know, skewered me, gigged me like a frog, you know? Well, kudos to you for writing a one off that ties fits so neatly into the Stephen Pressfield interview. Oh yeah. Because yeah. Mine didn't really <laughs> mine's way off the map. We know there is a line in the, uh, actually in gates of fire. It's in, there it goes. It's in this book right here. There is a line in here that says war is work. And, uh, and it's true. Like if you talk to guys who have served, if you, you know, if you read uh, anecdotes, whatever journals, war is work, get up, dig the trench, mm -hmm. polish the armor, make the campfire, cook, pack everything, load, yep. march one foot in front of the other. It's not glamorous. <clears throat> War is work. And so in for someone like me whose paradigm, the way I see the world is uh, see life as a war, you know, then everything is work, especially the things that matter. Mm -hmm. And so like writing is war. Mm -hmm. It's it's you versus the enemy. It's you yeah. versus yourself, resistance, demons, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And so, yeah, like there's liberation in the warfare. It doesn't get any better until you start fighting. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, that's what Pressfield says. He says, he says, uh, art is war. It's a war yeah. against your the, yourself. It's yeah. you, you are fighting against the the part of you that's trying to sabotage yourself. The war of art. Yeah. Yeah. Resistance is self sabotage. It is. It's you trying to trip you. Yeah. And keep you from doing what you want to do. <laughs> what you what and what you were probably put here to do. Yeah. Because like yeah. if you think about it, because I think what was going on was I was putting off I was putting off something, either listening to Adam's work or working on Sasquatch lips or getting prepped for the next Heavenly Realms or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just procrastinating. Mm -hmm. And I remember like just feeling that feeling is always there when you procrastinate, mm -hmm. of just feeling like you're in prison. Like you're chained and you're trying to run, but you're chained. So you're just like a dog on a, on a, you know, chain in the backyard. You're just straining against, <clears throat> you know, a leash. You're straining against the lead, you know, and then you're barking and you're chewing, but it's just, it's just choking you out and exhausting you. And it's not until you turn around and you start doing the thing you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It's not until you turn around, sit your ass in the chair, put your ass where your heart is, right. start writing that's when you can break those chains. Mm -hmm. So, and it doesn't happen a second beforehand. Anyways, speaking of a dog on a leash, <laughs> sweet. Yeah, good. I like dog stories. That's a good segue. This is a, uh, I guess, poem style short story. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't rhyme. There's no rhythm to it. Uh oh. So, but it's still a <laughs> still, poem somehow. Yeah, still uh, poetry. Right. It's poetry because you say it's poetry. That's. It's art because I say it's art. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's art because I use colors. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. It's called That's My Boy. Oh, sweet. It's time to take a swing. I know he's bigger than you, but he's got you cornered. I'm <laughs> on my way, but until I get there, you'll need to fight back. <laughs> he pushed you again. I see the tears in your eyes. I know you're scared. I'm almost there. Just need to chew this leash a few more times. <laughs> then I'll finish that bastard for you. <laughs> then we'll go home together. We'll tell mom and dad. And I'll lick your bruises while you eat ice cream. <laughs> Don't worry if you drip any on your shirt. I'll take care of that for you too. <laughs> I'll try not to kill him, the big one that pushed you. But you know how I get when I'm in a frenzy. <laughs> You've seen me shred. <laughs> Remember the cat? The mole? The slipper? Sorry about that slipper, by the way. <laughs> Still feel bad about that. <laughs> but that's all he is to me right now. A slipper. One big, fat, menacing place to put my foot 
or mm -hmm. paw, as you'd like to call it. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm almost. Whoa. You knocked him down <laughs> with one wild punch. <laughs> and now you're on top of him, pounding him, shredding him. <laughs> Didn't know you were big enough to shred. <laughs> You've grown up so much. <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> Let's go home now. Do you want to tell mom or dad? Can I still lick the ice cream off your shirt? <laughs> Do you forgive me for the slipper? <laughs> You're too big for it now anyway. You've grown out of it. Oh, and you can shred. <laughs> That's my boy. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's what every boy wants his dog to be. Yeah, it's right. Yep. What inspired you to do that? Uh, just wishing that Shelby was that kind of dog. Oh. <laughs> right. Like yeah. if, if Shelby was perfect, what would she be like? Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 If Shelby and Christian's relationship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah you never know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think uh, you never know what they'll do until they're put into that. Yeah, she's cool. She's getting up now. Come here, Shelby. Oh, oh yeah. You guys are talking about me? You guys are talking about me? That was a shorter one. Yeah, here she is. Dun, yeah. da, 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 da. There she is. What's up, sweetie? Oh, man. Good I mean, Shelby. Lily's kind of like that, too. She's, yeah. yeah, she's not exactly, you know, she's a good warning system. They love you and they'll shred for you. Mm hmm. If they can just get there in time. Yep. If they can <laughs> just get there in time. That's a great thing about dogs, man. You know, dog people, dog people get it. Yeah. It's tribal, you know, yep. parasympathetic nature. Yep. You know. <clears throat> Should we go on to our topic? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, let's talk about it. No our... surprise. Mm -hmm. We're talking about resistance. 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 The... And it is not futile. It no. kicks my butt almost every day. Oh, yeah, every day. It is so hard. Yeah. Yeah. When, um, you know, this is one thing I would like to – the, there really are probably like half a dozen serious questions that we could ask Pressfield when we have him back. I mean, it's a good thing to try and get him back on because there really is. And one of the questions I would want to ask, I had hoped to ask uh, Steve, was um, how does Stephen Pressfield fight resistance? Because Stephen Pressfield is kind of the, the you know the articulate master of of you know identifying the enemy, which is resistance. And then sort of qualifying it so that you can kind of figure out how to, you know, how to stab that saber toothed tiger, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. But for each person, resistance can take many different forms and therefore requires many different avenues of attack in order to defeat. Mm -hmm. So every person's fight against resistance is their own. Mm -hmm. You know, what is yours? You know, how do you... When resistance I'm horrible rares, at it. I'm horrible at it. I know it. I, I can recognize it. At least I can yeah. recognize the enemy. Uh, <clears throat> my resistance is all the things related to writing that aren't writing. Oh, right. So it's not getting up. Yeah. It's not going to Starbucks. It's not sitting down and opening my laptop. It's not any of that. I can do that. Yeah. I can be there five o'clock ready to start. Yeah. It's all the other stuff. Oh, I got to review this. Oh, I need right. to read back over this other chapter. Oh, I was wanting to post about this. Oh, I need to send an email to my man list. All those other things that are screaming. Mm -hmm. That need to be done. That, that need to be done. They're urgent, but they're not important. Yeah. You know, and, and pre another Pressfield quote is, there are things that are urgent, things that are important. And you should always, you should just focus on what's important. Yeah. You know, what's important is what has to be done. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's true. That's a... Not verbatim, but yeah. well, and you know that's uh, that sounds like an inversion at first. You know, your instinct is to say, "No, I need to do what's urgent," but that's the point. Is um, you know, like I there will always be something urgent, always right. Though I experience that in my day job. You know, my day job, my friend, my boss, he's a gunsmith. There's always somebody walking through the door who needs sights put on, or who needs you know some gun saved from whatever they've done to it. Mm -hmm. You know, that will never stop. In fact, a good buddy of mine, I talked to him yesterday working at another gun shop. Uh, there was a guy who came in who had a, um, an, an AR 10. So an AR, but in 308 mm -hmm. with a seven, six, two by 54 R round in it. So it's still the same bullet diameter, but it's for a bolt action Mosin Nagan. It's a bigger round. Mm -hmm. So they had jammed this big around into this oh, gun. Man. And like the way the AR works is like, that's, 
that's a real beast to try and fix, to try and like salvage this thing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And there's Oof. always going to be stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's like, you can always fritter away your time, you know, putting out these little brush fires, or you can stay on the path. I set like Flint on the objective and stay on the straight and narrow and do the thing you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And those things, because those, those are little demons with little poison daggers just mm -hmm. reaching up yeah, over the yeah, side yeah, of the yeah, road, yeah. Yeah. trying to cut your feet, you know, mm -hmm. they're always going to be there. And, and my big fight is to like, you know, convince my friend, you know, to just like, dude, either let me do that or let me book it into the system and let him go because you've got stuff that's been sitting around for a long time that needs to get fixed. You know, it's the same thing in the writing world. You know, you can, you know, I got to get this, I got to do this post, you know, in time, yeah. you know, to promote this thing, or I got to, I got to approve of this in order to get it, you know, sent off so I can get my copy or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but what I really need to do is sit down and do that chapter that I yeah. wanted to do. Yeah. You know, like Steve, I can do and It's funny. You know, it's what's funny is if I'm like, well, oh, it's just, you know, I just need to rough draft this next chapter. Yeah. Or, you know, rough draft the next couple of pages, you know, but if I let all, if I could do, if I put that aside and I do a hundred other things, mm -hmm. you know, run ads, make Facebook posts, make Instagram posts, review another chapter, email this person, you know, send, you know, do the, do the mailing list, whatever, contact yeah. the cover designer. I could get all of this stuff done. That's been piling up in one big session. But if I hadn't written that, I feel like I haven't, you haven't done anything. I haven't done anything. Yeah. And you, I'm, I feel been... clogged all day. Yeah. Like you... I'm constipated. Uh huh. Like you just been Roughly. punching the ocean. Yeah. And yeah, I feel so just discouraged and depressed. Yeah. But if I can just get that one thing out and put all that other stuff off. Yeah. I'll, I'm elated. You yeah. know, I'm on cloud nine all day. Well, and I think there's like a real because you've touched your purpose. Right. I think there's a real supernatural logos kind of like good versus evil thing going on with that because the temptation is to do all the little things, mm -hmm. you know, and the little things are really just temptations of your time and you can do all those little things, but you'll still have your main purpose waiting in the wings, unfulfilled, unsatisfied, untouched. <clears throat> and if you and if you do this, this is what you're really supposed to be doing, sitting down and writing that chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to the end of the day and you do that. And if all these little things go away, see, I get kind of like mystical about it a little bit mm -hmm. to where I think you well, that's what I like about Pressfield too. He Pressfield's does, so cool. Too. Yeah, he does he's, too. He's, he's kind of mystical about that. it too. He yeah. has, he really has. And I think he would probably agree with this that, like, you know what, if you focus on this thing, which is what you're supposed to be doing then all these little things that you could have been devoting your time to, if they fail, if they go away, if they vanish, you know, maybe you weren't supposed to do those anyways. Yeah. Maybe they weren't yeah. supposed to happen. Yeah. You know, like that's the faith part of being a writer, yeah. the humility part of, of, you know, of just trusting what God has laid in front of you mm -hmm. of like, I really need to do this. I could do this review. I could make this post. I could promote this thing. But maybe in the grand scheme that I'm not aware of, I'm not supposed to. Maybe those things aren't supposed to happen if me sacrificing what I'm supposed to do to do them makes them happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to focus on this. And if these go away, maybe I wasn't supposed to do those in the first place. You know. And if you guys I set like Flint. One of the biggest things to me that's inspiring about Stephen Pressfield, and we yeah. talked about it a little bit when we were interviewing him, uh, and if you guys don't, and if you guys know this, forgive me. But for those of you who are watching and don't know this, Stephen Pressfield wrote novels for 27, yeah. 28 years before his first novel was published. <clears throat> yeah, and it was the Legend of Bagger Vance. Yeah, yeah, the Legend of Bagger Vance. Twenty-seven to twenty-eight years. Yeah. And that's the thing about people that um, that you really have to like. I've been doing it my whole life. Like, it's all it's arguably like the only thing I'm good at. And even that is like, not really. <laughs> but That's not true. You're amazing. You're an amazing I mean, But like, uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm obligated to say that because it's a writer's group. Yeah. And we're right here. Yeah, we gotta be, yeah. uh, gotta be uh, encouraging to each other. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> You're awesome. But no, but like, that's all I've ever, that's all I've ever known. 
but I see new people come into it, you know, and you were an exception to this, but I, I've seen new people come into the novel writing game and, um, you know, and it's been a while since I've, I've had this. It's been several years since I've had this interaction with somebody, but they think like, I'm going to write a novel. They get impatient. I'm going to write a novel. I'm going to be done with it, you know, in a year and have it published. You know, they have this fantasy, this, mm. the short term yeah. fantasy of what it is. And it's like, Man, that's not. I mean, maybe, you know, sure, maybe, Ho yeah. and hopefully, yeah, like, yeah. good for you. Yeah, Oops, to sorry, an guys. extent. Sorry about that. You know, and you kind of want them to like pay their dues a little bit. Yeah, everybody, won't, you need to pay your dues. You know, it's good to struggle. Mm -hmm. It's good to suffer. Um, and that's another question for Pressfield that I would love to ask him. Is like, and I think everybody's a little different, but kind of want to ask him like, do you think it is intrinsic to the author's journey? for their character building to struggle and suffer, you know, and to also like, do you think there's, there's somebody, there's a writer who can exist without having a vice? Mm, it's just about every writer. That's a good question. That's a, a great question. See what I mean? Like, yeah, dude, that's a good mystery. really could have done this for like two gotta hours. Write these down. I know. Yeah, we got to do that one. The vice time. question yeah. we have to do next time we talk to him. Yeah. That's a great, great question. Uh, well, cause I had my cousin Andy tell me one time, you know, cause I, I'm always trying to quit smoking and he was like, you know what, honestly, man, you're probably always going to have something like you know, and it's like uh, on one hand, it's like you don't want to keep you want to quit because, you know, it's not good for you. But on the other hand, you don't want to stress yourself out so much trying to quit that you actually make you're you're fighting what you are, you know, and there's and there's that that guilt and tug, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. of, of trying to figure out where you fall in that line, mm. you know, because everybody's different. But there is a part of it that's just like, man, every writer just about has a ten. I don't a know a creative who doesn't have a vice. Yeah. I mean, Presswell may be an exception. With know, the exception knows. of God. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, even who Rome. I guess is the, you know, kind of the. The archetypal author of it all. He's supposed yeah. to be like the stencil. <laughs> Right. You know, can I use <laughs> yeah. that word? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, man, you know, you do, you get these writers who they're fresh on the scene and, and they have this idea of what they think it should be. Yeah. You know, based off of whatever, you know, mis preconceived notions and misconceptions. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you don't understand, man. Like if you're not in this, for the love of the game. Mm -hmm. If you're not in this because not even the love of the game. If you're not in this because you feel you feel burdened and cursed. You feel like you're gonna die if you don't write. Yeah, you feel burdened and cursed with a mantle of responsibility that you have to wear. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That is it is your duty. It is your job. It's like you've, you've taken, failed at life if you don't do it. You've, yeah. you've wasted your life. You've, you've totally failed. You be, you're a coward if you don't. Ooh. That's what Ooh, it feels like. the C word. Yeah. It, <laughs> honestly, like if you're – if you as a writer do not feel like you have stood before God and taken an oath of allegiance to do this mission, this you have been commissioned as an officer in this war, mm -hmm. you know, or as a foot soldier in this war mm -hmm. to – yeah, you're just like – you're shirking your responsibility. You're running away from the battle by not mm -hmm. writing. If you don't feel that, mm -hmm. then you don't have. You probably don't have the passion that it takes uh, to yeah. to ever. You know, no, maybe not. You know, maybe they're like, dude, you could like write some, you know, fruity little gothic horror fiction, and you know, maybe have a career for yourself and make money. But I mean, how is that any different than just like a Faustian bargain? Yeah. You know. So, yeah. Anyways. Nate. Uh, Nate said, uh, "I'm a fan." Uh, and I don't know if what he was referring to because I just <laughs> saw it just now, and that was probably a few minutes ago. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, no, was, yeah, a couple minutes ago. Yeah, a couple minutes ago. Yeah. But uh, I'm assuming he said we were talking about uh, we were talking about your writing. Oh yeah, Nate's you know? yeah, Nate's super yeah. sweet man. Yeah. He's, and he's very you're, good to you're me, a very you know? talented writer. But more importantly, Nate's a good writer too. To, actually. According to Pressfield, you know, you're a hard worker. You're hardworking. The work is what's important. He says talent is shit, basically. Yeah, it kind of is. You know, like, talent doesn't matter. It's the work. It's the work that matters. He worked for right. 27, 28 years. Yeah, well, and talent and skill are not the same things. So, like, mm -hmm. talent is what you're born with, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in Pressfieldian, you know, Hellenic terms, it's like your daemon, your demon that you're born with. You know, your, your self that's alongside the self. Yeah. It's in the genes. Skill 
is what you work on. It's what you hone and develop and machine and fine tune. Dude, and I'll tell you, being at you Lee, know? going to Lee University and being in the yeah. music program, I saw people with talent that thought they were going to succeed because they had talent. Yeah. And I saw people come in with no talent that built their skills and built outpaced their skills. them. That yeah. graduated before Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Accomplished more than them musically. Yeah. The talent guy came in and he stayed right there. Yeah. The skill guy came in and got yeah. way ahead of him because he worked. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like if I could, you know, learn from learn from my failures because I'm uh, I, I fall on the talent end in that like I've always wanted to do it and mm -hmm. I've always done it. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to plateau mm -hmm. doing that. But and and I'm terrible at discipline. I, I'm terrible at like, you know, I don't have a regimen. Uh, I mean, regimens come and go for me. Like I'll have them for a while and something will happen. I'll get knocked off my horse, knocked off the wagon. Um, that's what I admire about Nick. Nick has a regimen and he sticks to it. And that discipline, that regimen, that like just yeoman like work, do the work. That. War is work. Yeah. Get up every day. Like Pressfield, he gets up every day at 3 a.m. He goes to the gym. Dude, he's got me beat. He's got me. Oh, yeah. Dude, dude, I, yeah. I'm half his age. He's got me beat. <laughs> That guy's so, amazing, you know? dude. That's amazing. But but that's you know that's the thing is like, don't rely just on your raw talent. You know, don't like those guys at Lee. You know, you'll never make it past a certain level. Mm -hmm. And I would much rather see somebody. That's why I'm always encouraging my friends like Delta. You know, Delta would make a great writer. First of all, Delta's hilarious. He's far punnier than I am. Cool. He's good at it. Cool. You know, and yeah, like the Slayer. Oh, dude, his, <laughs> his daughter. I gotta, I gotta like give his daughter a special nod because she came up with the phrase "squatch blocked." Ah, that's great. So, yeah, it's really great. But, um, but people like that, you know, there is this like insecurity to, to the arts. You know, you think like, well, I'm not an artist. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you might not have like the passion inside of you since like six years old to do this. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you can't do it, and that doesn't mean that you can't be successful at it. I mean, Nick didn't start writing till like three years ago. Yeah, I was forty when I yeah, started. Yeah, he was forty when he started yeah. his his writing career. Literally, he was forty years Struck old. Struck me like a bull. It's like a, that is your midlife crisis. It was. Know? Yeah, my midlife crisis was. You know, I think I'm going to write this uh, book for my kids. Yeah, and Nick ended up like not only is he far more successful, uh, more prolific, more industrious. You know, but like he's actually this is my favorite thing about it. Nick has stuck, yes. <sighs> Nick <laughs> smell that part. Smells like me. <laughs> it smells like burrito. <laughs> yeah. uh, I appreciate you saying that. But, but the it's... but the thing that I've really admired about Nick the most truly has been the fact that he has stuck with it, maintained discipline, and because I've watched Nick do a bunch of different things, but this is the thing that he's stuck with the most. And like that discipline, that's just like, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go sit in front of the computer at Starbucks at 5 a.m., mm -hmm. you know, every morning. Be there at 5, yep. Well, you just, that's the Pressfieldian method of just show up. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yep. And, and it's, it happens to me. When I'm able to muster up my discipline, when I'm able to like stop being so weak, mm -hmm. you know, and can actually like be strong and do the thing, when you sit in the chair, dude. Yeah. When you sit in the chair – even if it doesn't happen the way you want it to happen, something happens. Yeah. Every time. Something happens. There's never been a time where I've sat in the chair and just be like, <laughs> you know, like every time something happens. Yeah. So. Jim, uh, Jim had a comment. Uh, Jim says, uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yeah, gosh, that's so true. That's the true. great thing about Jim. Jim is a he's a football coach. I was going to say, yeah, Jim, that sounds he, he gets it. Straight out of coaching. That is such a Jim would be awesome to have on. I know. You know how cool know. it would be to have Jim. Well, I'm telling you this. Live stream. We're going to document this via video. This is in the annuals of the internet now. When yeah. Jim comes to visit. Yeah. He'll be on this with we'll do a three. We'll do a three man live stream and in the meantime I would like to have him on as a guest. It would be cool. I mean, I'd like to talk to Jim about coaching and how coaching can translate to, you know, oh, that'd be cool. artistic endeavors, writing, yeah. you know, and, cool. and we'll try to – Jim, we'll try to talk politics without – Jim, if you're feeling <laughs> super pressured right now, my apologies. I don't want you to – We've known Jim uh, for years. Yeah. Jim is like Nick's best friend. Man, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, you know, he's one of those Jim. like, you know – 
the hard, we were talking about like the hard to find yeah friend mentor figure. Hard to, yeah oh for sure yeah yeah mentor figure oh for sure yeah for sure. Uh, delta is like that for me in a lot of ways um but there's no way in hell i'll ever get Delta. oh and look who else is joining <laughs> us camera. oh baby oh Andy's man Andy here. Goss. yep welcome Andy to the party our, baby he's our wild cousin mm -hmm. wild yep. cousin from down in georgia mm -hmm. and man we're glad you're watching and Glad you're recovering too. He had some uh, he had some issues recently. Yeah, some had a had a scare. Yeah. yeah. So glad you're doing better and uh, good enough to indulge your cousin's egos. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We appreciate, yeah. man. Well, I'm pretty sure it was probably scarier for the doctors and nurses who, you know, <laughs> sure it was. And you know yeah. what? Good. Yeah. <laughs> good. They're gonna charge your Dude, insurance. Dude, I'm telling you, man. If I ever go, if, stuff. if I ever go under the knife, when they cut into me, it's gonna be a bunch of McGriddles to pop out. <laughs> Yeah, you It'll know what? Bacon and eggs. No shame. McGriddles are good. I was a uh, fountain of coffee <laughs> shooting out of my esophagus. I wanted uh, I wanted hamburgers last night, so I went by Kroger after work, and I was just like, I'm gonna just pick up whatever, some buns and some onions and some tomatoes or whatever. Ended up with like three hundred dollars worth of groceries every time. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta do the list. Yeah, because I only like and don't do it hungry. I do like quarterly grocery shopping. Like I only go four <laughs> times a year, so it's that's like, actually really smart. Yeah, it's only go it's to like Sam's a, or something and do that. I know I need a Sam's Club membership. Well, because I'm always like throwing stuff in the freezer. Yeah, they're you know? really bad about mask. They're still on the mask game. They're still doing the mask enforcement. So they, I don't know if that you probably wouldn't like. That. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. No thanks. I'll do the other one, Costco. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so I got like some frozen Tyson chicken. I yeah. love. I used to have this thing, this ritual where every Saturday I would make like uh, Tyson, um, uh, like buffalo chicken strips or like the honey mm -hmm. barbecue chicken strips on a bed of romaine uh, yeah, or great. like spinach leaves mm -hmm. and then make some fish sticks. And I'd sit down with like a platter of this stuff and I would just gorge myself and watch old Twilight Zone episodes. <laughs> And that it sounds was, amazing. By it's the way. so much fun. It was so much fun. I have no regrets. I wasn't dating anybody at the time. I was a total basement dwelling loser, and I cared nothing about. It, it was so great. If you've never watched old Twilight Zone episodes, you got to check them out. They're super cool. But um, but the little uh, sixteen year old chick at you know bagging my groceries oh, like held up the Tyson bag after I paid for it, which was like okay. And she was like, you know, like I I heard there's a little recall on these, you know. And I was like, yeah, you know what. There is a recall on it, or there's not a recall, but like there was a story that leaked about like the chicken, you know, at the Tyson plants, like being in unsanitary, you know, situations, you know, like, you know, mm. scratching around in their own crap or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And just like, <laughs> whatever. Whatever. Like, yeah. I don't, it's so all fires processed, for. anyways. Yeah. It's all processed, anyways. It's like that line from Kolchak the Night Stalker, uh, the TV show where like Darren McGavin's character, if you've never seen Kolchak the Night Stalker, by the way, that's another show. They only did one. one season. It was X Files in the seventies. Okay. X Files before X Files. It's Cold hilarious. Okay. It's where I started writing on my typewriter. Actually. Ah, yeah. that's why you started writing on the typewriter. Kolchak the Night Stalker Ooh, I is get why I said the very first thing I ever wrote on my. You night. gotta shoot me a link. Oh, I will. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta yeah. check it out. It's really it's Cold so it's Jack. Kolchak, not Colt, Col not Kojak. Colt, Colt Chak, C O L K O L C H A K. Kolchak. Okay. Kolchak, the Night Stalker. I got to check it out. Darren McGavin. They only uh -huh. did one season. Campy, fun, yeah. super great. Yeah, Jim says it's a great 70s show. Oh, dude, see, Jim knows. Yeah, Jim knows what I'm talking about. And apparently uh, Grafton's watching, too. Grafton oh, is sweet. my, my yeah. first cousin once removed in law. <laughs> yeah, that sounds That's right. accurate, by the way. Yeah, uh-huh. Which is um, great. Hey, Grafton. Yeah. So, anyway, Kolchak, the Night Stalker. There, there's a out. scene, though, where he, he walks up. He's a, he's a reporter. And he gets into all these like supernatural things, Wendigos and vampires. Ooh, yeah, and, Wendigo. And Jack, uh, Jack the Ripper, you know, and all these different guys or whatever. And uh, he comes up to a guy who's like an exterminator and he's eating like a sandwich, you know, mm -hmm. while he's like spraying a yard, you know. Yeah. It's like, right. And Cole Jack is uh. like, hey, isn't that like maybe unhealthy? And the guy's like, it's all full of preservatives anyways. Uh. That's exactly how I felt with the chick at Kroger last night. It's like. All this stuff. And what would you eat? You, what would you eat while you watch that? Uh, Tyson chicken, honey barbecue, uh, or buffalo chicken strips. It's so delicious. Oh my gosh. On a bed of spinach leaves with ranch dressing for mm. the or blue cheese, either mm. one for the chicken strips. I got I got like, just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a little, you know. <laughs> and then you got to get like some. Uh, you got to get ketchup and tartar sauce. 
for the fish sticks if you do fish sticks or some like sort of tiger sriracha kind of like spicy ginger glaze oh, dipping sauce for the fish sticks. Yeah, Jump. it's really good. I'm so hungry right now. Yeah, we're pretty hungry. On that note. Yeah. Time for a refill. Yeah. Why eat when you can drink? That's the Irish way. <laughs> you know, you good? Oh, I'm good. You're yeah. good? Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Mm. <laughs> See, I've killed chickens from a Tyson. Yeah, see, so Nate knows. Yeah, Nate also said that. Um, Nate says that he's killed animals from a Tyson from farm. From a Tyson farm. Ooh, yeah. Interesting. Nate also said that resistance for him uh, was uh, what was it? The fence. Uh, uh, Sheep and oh, fence. Oh, there it is. I didn't yeah, miss it. I'm sorry, Nate. I missed it. Let's see. Nate's uh, got my some. biggest resistance is my sheep and my yeah, fence. Because Nate does some homesteading. It's really cool. He's up in like really? the northern edge of Tennessee. And, um, yeah, it'll keep you busy, man. Well, and that's the thing, like, especially on a farm, there's no, like, there's no rest on a farm, you know, like it, yeah. it's just, it's always, it's every day it's waiting. Man, I don't know how you could be a writer and handle the responsibilities of a farm because like, when would you write? I mean, there isn't a, there isn't a daylight hour. Yeah. Yeah. You're Nate, not, what's you're your, not working on the farm. Yeah. Do you, Nate, do you like scroll away time in the evening or do you just catch pockets wherever you can? I'd be curious yeah, to hear about Yeah. That. I would like to know. I mean, how, I don't know how. How you do this? Plus, you got a little one at home. Yeah, you know, you're a married man. You got the family life going on, the homestead life, the farming life going on. It's like, how do you fit creative endeavor into that? Yeah, you know. Yeah, man, bigger man than me. It's hard sure. enough, even in suburban life. Yeah, you know, it's hard enough for me just with a day job and a dog. Suburban, you know? suburbia, suburbia, or yeah. disturbia because <clears throat> it's such a distortion of what real life is supposed to look like. Yeah, yeah. How much fun do you think it's going to be when uh, when the when the knock vaccinations? Come? Oh, they're going to knock on our doors. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait for them to knock. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Do you? It's like which do you do? Do you just not answer the door, or do you play the game and see? Because it's we like, have to answer the door. They're going to keep coming back and knocking. You have to confront it at some point. Just do it the first time, I think. Yeah. Just be ready. Just know what you're going to say. Know what yeah. snide, snarky little mm -hmm. thing you're going to say and just wait for them to push back so you can knock them, knock them out. Just like knock them down your steps. Yeah. Just do that Spartan 300 kick. Yes, the Spartan yeah. 300 kick. This, this is Spring Hill. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Just pipe it in over the, you know, <laughs> like some speakers. <laughs> Even me, hit it! <laughs> dun, 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 no, I'll be dun, like, dun, 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 yeah. This is personal, free responsibility and independent living. <laughs> and then be like, okay, go, even me, go ahead. And she opens her window, and just dumps hot tar on the guy <laughs> from above, and just melts just in front of me. Medieval on yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. This is liberty. Just be. I'll, I'll be like. I'll be like the nerdy kid from the Matrix, you know, when they gun him down, but he's like holding the two, like. Dude, when they the come two, to your door and they ask you to be vaccinated, <laughs> just start coughing on them. <laughs> yeah. Just start yeah. hacking up. Just hack up. Yeah. Sneeze, <coughs> cough, run a fever. Uh huh. You know, just really play it up. Yeah. Like, I haven't been vaccinated. <laughs> just like, just get a little woozy, a little like head heavy, like. Uh, or you could lie to him. Uh, yeah. What 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 do you think would be the. Uh, Backlash. Would it be illegal to lie if they came to your door and they were trying to see if you were vaccinated and you said, yeah, sure, I'm vaccinated. They came onto your personal property to ask that and you lied to them to make them go away. What would be the legal reper uh, repercussions yeah, of that? I mean, they, they probably just come back and, and be like, well, they probably ask for verification. They probably ask for your vaccine card. Oh, yes. I know. Yeah, it's, know. In, it's in my uh, back pocket. Why don't you reach in and yeah, you know, you can, I keep reach around and grab it? Keep it in my front pocket and reach in and well, it depends on who's knocking. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sir, I'm going to need you to step back. You are allowed to. <laughs> you, the little little redhead right there. You can... Yeah, well, I'll go get my, uh... yeah, sure, I got my uh, vaccine ID. Uh, it's in my gun safe. Why yeah. don't you wait right here while I go grab <laughs> yeah. something? I mean, really, the trick is you want to be, like, second or third wave. You don't want to be first wave of those, of those knocks because first wave is going to be pretty messy, and so, and it should be. You know, it deserves to be. Uh, and so I think after, like, first wave, like, people are going to be like, mm, I'm not, you know, I'm not getting paid enough mm -hmm. to deal with this. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to. You make it uncomfortable yeah. enough for them, they'll stop doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's been the other side's tactic. Yeah. If you're loud enough and make it uncomfortable enough for them, they will stop that behavior. Yeah. You know, what do we got going on here in the <laughs> chat? 
<laughs> um, let's see. Nathan says full time job. Yeah. Cold and dark hours on yeah. the homestead. Uh, Jim says. Oh. <laughs> Good Jim, Jim says, just open the door and stare with a slight smile. Don't say a word. Now, if you know Jim. That's smart on a lot of levels. That would scare someone at a very, <laughs> right. at, yeah. at a very deep level. Anybody who has survival they would, instincts. Right. They'd feel a slight tremor like, oh, yeah. I don't think I need to be here. Okay, yeah. have a nice day, sir. You know, you gotta, you, Jim could definitely pull that off. Yeah. You could definitely pull that off. Yeah. Get that football coach persona going on and, and yeah that'd be great yeah i like to stare sometimes i do that and i stare at those people and then i think about like all the things i'd like to do to them like i just fantasize in my head about all the just butchery that i'd like to do to them i don't have that intimidating <clears throat> build and uh you get the height i got i got the height but the i don't have helps. i don't have the countenance of someone who's intimidating mm. but i'll say this if they come to what i can do because i've yeah. seen this work on the internet when uh, guys like bow up and they, you know, and they're thinking about them, uh, the victim will just drop their pants and be naked. So I might open the door and just be <laughs> butt naked. Yeah. With my yeah. thing hanging out. Yeah. Or just barely poking out, however you want to look at it. <laughs> you know, and just be totally stark naked except for my glasses and maybe a tiki hat or something. <laughs> maybe so a little crazy. coconut bra, but yeah. nothing down south. Yeah. Nothing south you know? side. And yeah. just be like, hey, how are you? Yeah. Hi. Would you like to come in? Would you like to come in for a coconut rum? You know, maybe a nice rub down. my door. Totally, it's not. It's not. It, it, it's not public exposure. Can't be indecent exposure because I'm not in public. Yeah. Or or just get like a thong. Get a banana hammock. Yeah, I mean, my neighbors directly across the street. Most of them have children, so yeah. I have to be careful about that. But it it can technically be uh, indecent exposure if you can be seen from the street like that. Mm -hmm. So what I would recommend is getting like one of those uh, elephant trunk banana hammocks. And wearing yes. that. Yes. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then like your tiki hat, coconut bra. Yes. Get an ensemble guy. <laughs> hey, ensemble. Know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just yes, a. Yes, I should do uh, Yeah. Uh, what does it say? Oh, Jim says, uh, uh, Jim says, great, you're here. Did you bring <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, just come up with a fruity drink, yeah. you know, a coconut drink with some umbrellas in it and be like, did you bring the oil? Yeah. Are you are you here for the sensual message? You know, I have. You're gonna be amazed at what we can do with that clipboard. <laughs> I have ice cubes. I have applications. And I have coconut oil. Do you like pina coladas? <laughs> and then just you know, just see if you can just break them out. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or show up to the door and have a syringe in your hand with God knows what in it. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe Tabasco. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, and be like, I'll tell you what, let's trade. Yeah. Yeah. You take this, I'll take whatever you got. What you got? Yeah. I'll let's yeah. Trade. Yeah, what you got? You got some. You good? shoot up me, I'll shoot you yeah. up. Let's yeah. See what you got. Yeah. I go first though, because you're on my property. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll even make it easy for it. I'll just have air in mine. How about that? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's just a lot of air. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, I was in uh, when I was in for my small bowel obstruction like ten years ago. I did have air in my IV, like little pockets, and I like I actually like kind of freaked out and I hit the button. And I was like, "Hey, I got air in my uh, in my thing. Is that gonna be a problem? Am I gonna die?" You know, <laughs> like, like you watching the air bubble get closer. I was. I was watching the trail down the, the, down the coming down to yeah, the guys, tube. Oh, guys, 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 guys. guys. Uh, guys. <laughs> I didn't know if I needed to mm, yank Dude, it out, you know. Check but, this out. But they told me that it takes a lot of that. It actually takes a lot of it air. It takes a lot of air. Yeah. Not just a little bubble. No, no, right. no. You can, you can take a lot before you die. Check out what Cousin Andy says. I've got some photos of the Claremont house here in town oh, where they're cool. going to be filming Stranger Things season four. Yeah. I love Stranger Things. If you yeah. have an email, what place for me to send it? Oh, man. Yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. I'll send you an email. That's really cool. That's Stranger cool. Things is amazing. You know, the cool thing about Stranger Things is the first season, the way they did the upside down, the alternate dimension. Yeah. You know, kind of like the spirit, almost like a spirit realm that mm -hmm. exists alongside ours. Yeah. Uh, it was so clever and so well done. And that was before all like the conspiracy and the interdimensional Bigfoot and, oh, yeah. You know, all the Genesis 6 stuff mm -hmm. we talked about. You know, it really was. Stranger Things yeah. season one kind of by several predated years. Predated that in popularity, cultural popular popularity. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to see what they do with season four because all the kids are like giants now. Are they really? Oh, yeah. I haven't seen anything after season one. 
I've only seen season one. I, I'm behind on. As they get older things. into their teens, they just kind of get more annoying. Mm, yeah, and it gets true. a little more adult. It's not like I can, you know. That's a hard decision to make as a writer to keep them kids. You know, of like, do you do you stay with the same characters who are going to get grow up and become normal people? They're going to lose their charm, their Spielbergian, you know, ET charm. You know, the Goonies is going to go away. You know, and you're going to get something more akin to like the Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. do you stick with those same characters as a writer, or do you stick with the motif? Mm. That's a that's something Good that question. yeah, as a writer, like you know, if you if you write an ongoing series, you know, like that was a J.K. Rowling thing. Now she made the right call with Harry Potter to stick with the characters because you cared about the characters. Mm -hmm. But there, but like Chronicles of the Black Company is one of those where it. It's really more about the company than it is the characters. There are some characters who it like really focuses on. Yeah. But it takes place over something like 70 years. Yeah. So like the guys you start out with by the time, you know, the series ends, they're they're either dead or old. Yeah. You know, and there are other characters who come along the way. So Nate's know. out of here. Nate's got a drop. So Nate, see you later, man. Thanks for joining. I'm see glad you, you watched it. Hope you enjoyed the interview. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll plug this real quick. Um, Nate is uh in charge of Taurus Necris Publishing. He worked really hard on this. This is the, the special edition hardcover. of Empyrean Falling. It's in hardcover, yep. no dust jacket. Which yep. is pretty we don't believe about. in that. Nope. Uh, it's got a custom cover. It has a map on the back, and then it is 650 pages long. Nate uh, edited this. This was a real labor of love for him, and he did an excellent job. Yeah, so looks good. Looks really if good. You, uh, if you're interested in seeing what Stephen Pressfield can produce as far as, like, you know, his fans and, like, you know, what his what his tutelage can produce, yeah. this is a really good example. Uh, you can get it on TarsNecris.com. Uh, I always put the links in the bottom. I'll do that probably later on tonight whenever I get back to the house and can – you know, do all my, my post-production stuff on these live streams, but you can go to any of our other live streams or to my Facebook or Instagram or any of that stuff. Taurus is where yep. you can get this. Yep. Um, I can't remember the price on it. I think it's maybe like 30 bucks or something, but it's worth it. Uh, and there's a lot of work that went into this, especially the map. Everybody wanted a map uh, back in the day. So we finally, Nate and I sat down and finally did a map. So Really happy, really proud of this. Um, really grateful for all the hard work that Nate put into this. This is totally worth it. So, um, anyways, Nate, have a good night, bud. Yeah, man. I got to pee and it. I'm hungry, so I kind of want to wrap this up. Yeah, and can you believe the camera hadn't even died yet? I know. We haven't hit the two-hour yeah. mark yet. Uh, Andy asked if we're still on tomorrow. We are not. We're doing a Saturday live stream in lieu of Sunday. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, we won't be on for tomorrow. Yeah. But, uh, That's why I told you to skip that Home Depot, homie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Andy doesn't listen to anybody. That's why. That's partly why I love Andy. Yeah. It's also why I get frustrated. But whatever. Andy yeah. lives his life, baby. Yeah. Andy's in charge of Andy, <laughs> except for Lisa, who's also in charge of Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I love Andy. You know they're having to, they're having to sit on Andy too, man. He's he's probably going. He's recovering. Closer. Yeah. And he's dying to get out, and they're probably like, "No, don't do." It. And he's yep. like, "Screw you guys! I'm yeah, I'm going I'm anyways. It. I'm doing it. I'm getting in the truck, and I'm going." I would not want to be the yeah. one trying to keep Andy in the house. I would not be no. Andy's handler. No, you know, I, I love, I respect the guy too much. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like, you know, dude, it's your well, life. I value my, you know? my yeah, and I value health. my life. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Andy don't need no gun. <laughs> let me tell you, you know, that's why Grafton is a brave man. You know, yeah. So, anyways. Well, guys, it's great to talk to you. Great to see you. We had a great. Uh, thank you for the for the chat comments. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we're gonna take off, and uh, we'll see you guys later. And I hope you enjoyed. If you didn't, if you did, if you joined after the Pressfield interview, it's the first thirty minutes of this live stream. Yeah, it'll go be back in the and replay. Watch yeah, yeah, that'll be available just here in a few minutes. You'll be able to go and watch it. So. Yeah. That's all for me. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good, man. Yeah. All right. Thanks to Stephen Pressfield for doing this. This was a dream come true, and yep. uh, this was something that we've been trying to plan for months, really, and we yep. finally got it worked out. Yep. So it's been really awesome. Uh, a Man at Arms is his latest book. Uh, go to his website, stephenpressfield.com. I'll post the link down down below. Not that he needs it. but, <laughs> yeah. but And you if know. you want a signed copy, I'll sell you one because I've got yeah. some, all of these are signed copies. Yeah. yeah. I got plenty. So. Jamie and I, Jamie just got back from uh, a trip. So my marketing manager, so we're going to, uh, we're going to talk sometime soon about uh, working up some sort of a contest or some sort of a promotion where mm -hmm. you buy all of the heavenly realms books and you can get a signed oh, that's copy cool. as well. Along well, with I'll tell swag, you what, if you want to buy a signed copy from me, 
Yeah, he'll just let me know it. now yeah. because I'm holding on to most of these until they make a movie of it. Yeah. And then they're really going to be worth it. Yeah. yeah. Totally, man. So get one now. Yeah. Jim Caviezel. You know they will. Or Vigo Mortensen. I see. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's I hadn't yeah, thought about Vigo one. Mortensen. That's yeah. a good pull. So. Yeah, he's a ranger. Anyways, uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are the Goslings. And we will see you guys next Sunday. See you guys.